China, the world's oldest civilization was born here. Thousands of years later, it is one of the world's chess powerhouses. For most of the past 30 years, China has held the most prestigious title in women's chess. The legacy of the Women's World Championship is rich. Menchik, Gaprindashvili, and Chibodonitsa, Kostenyuk, Zijun, and Ho Yifan. Now three-time world champion Zhu Wenjun is defending her title once more. After vanquishing the likes of Katerina Lagno and Alexandra Goryashkina, another rival awaits. Challenger Lei Tingzhe had to defeat three grandmasters in matches herself to get here. In the first two rounds of the candidates, she took on sisters Maria and Anna Muzichuk and won. Then in the final, she beat former world champion Tang Zhongyi. And that's it! Resignation! Lei Tingzhi, the winner of the 2023 Honey Dates Finals. Will Ju Wenjun defend? Or will we have a first-time champion, Lei Tingzhe? Half the match is in Ju's hometown of Shanghai. Half the match in Chongqing, where Lei hails from. Who will win and claim their share of the 500,000 euro prize fund? Welcome to the official broadcast of the 2023 FIDE Women's Chess Championship. Hello everyone and we are back in Chongqing and this is it. We have now reached the final two classical games in the Women's World Championship match and it is down to the wire. With five points each, nothing can separate challenger Lei Tingzhe from reigning Women's World Champion Ju Wenjun. But everything can change in these two classical games as it comes down to who has the stronger nerves and the greater stamina. Well, we will find out today. I'm your host, International Master Ivanka Halska, and it is a great pleasure to be commentating all the action alongside one of the most inspiring advocates of women chess. She's been two-time US champion. She's an author of some of the best-selling chess books, Chess Bitch, Play Like a Girl, and of course, my personal favorite, Chess Queens. She also set up a YouTube channel, go follow it. It's called How to Beat Your Mom in Chess. It is none other than Women Grandmaster, Jennifer Shahade. Jennifer, I know it's super early in the morning, but I'm gonna say it anyway, good morning. Yes, good morning. I am so excited to call games 11 and 12 of the Women's World Championship with you, Jovi. This is really a dream come true. I've got my coffee. Nobody else is awake here in Philadelphia, except other chess fans, perhaps. And I'm just <laughs> really enjoying life. <laughs> it's good. Ah, no, you've got to you got to enjoy the chess because boy, it's been such a tense and exciting, thrilling match. I mean, I just can't stop raving about it. I mean, so close as well. And games one to six were played in Shanghai, and both Lei Tingzhe and Zhu Wanjun and the press conference they did promise us fighting chess, and that is certainly what they have delivered. Because on paper, if you were to look at the openings, you would say, well, Berlin's is going to be a draw. And it was a draw. But these two, they really took it to the brink and they played every game out. And I have to say, Shanghai, it was more about Lei Ting Jay. And she finally crashed through in game five. And games seven to 12, well, they were played in Chongqing, which is ironically Lei Ting Jay's hometown. But there, it was all about Rennie, Women's World Champion Ju Wenjun, as she changed tack, she changed her openings around. And it was Ju Wenjun that has scored the decisive victory in game eight and we're here game 11 game 12 yet to be played what do we think yeah well i was watching your broadcast with uh, judah polgar when 
Um, you saw the Carol Khan on the board and you just like <laughs> leaped out of your chair. You were so excited, Jovi. I mean, you have written a book on this opening. So what's it going to be today? I think it's going to be the Scandinavian and then you're going to have to jump out of your chair again. I will really jump out of my chair. I think I will do a loop around the room. If Ju and Jim plays the Scandinavian, that would be very unexpected. I think your brother would also join me. And he is a big, or is he a big anti-Scandi fan? Okay. Anti-Scandi, yeah, yeah. This is an anti-Scandinavian uh, defense family, that's for sure. But uh, yeah, let's let's. How about we compromise and like the C pawn is moved, right? So one of us is going to be happy. It's either going to be the Carolcon or the Sicilian. But to recap, it's it's been um, these five white games of Lightning Che. This is going to be her sixth white. We've seen two Berlins, a Joko Piano. That's the one that she won. Fantastic game. And then we also had the Sicilian and the Caracan. So what do you think yeah. it's going to be, Jovi? You've seen the whole match. What opening yeah. do you I, I honestly don't know. Just because Ju Wonjun has been changing up so much. It's, like, it's late in Jay. She's come well prepared. She's determined. She seems to know her openings inside out. So when you're facing an opponent like that, one of the best kind of strategies is simply just to keep changing. And this half we've seen you know, Karaka, we see the Sicilian. I suspect we might see a Sicilian once more, but uh, there we do see Ju Wenjun leaning back in her chair. But either way, whether she plays an E4, E5, whether she plays a Karaka or a Sicilian, or even maybe the French defense, I am here for it. Oh yeah, and I'm here for that bright orange shirt. I mean, that's a real statement. Um, absolutely stunning color here. Lei Tingche um, playing the white pieces. We're gonna see E4, I think that's pretty clear. And the big question is what opening will we have from Ju and June? I mean, I did notice that in the game that she played at Carol Khan, she got a sizzling position, Jovi. I mean, that was a potential win for Ju and June as well, right? There was a lot of um, possibilities for her there. Definitely. And Ji Wenzhen seems to have found the style where she is most comfortable in challenging Lei Tingjie. And it seems to be all about playing quite provocative chess and just asking Lei Tingjie just to make those committal moves forward. And uh, Lei Tingjie, as you mentioned, always looking confident, looking up, smiling, giving us expressions. We do see the move E2, E4 played on the board. And what am I seeing? the move that was taken back for Ju and Jun, because this is an interesting uh, match because the dignitaries always play both a first move for white and the first move for black. Ah, but that's like, a, so that's not the real moves on the board yet. So she, she could play a different move than E5? Yeah, she could play a different move. But we did see, did see E4, E5 from the dignitary. So, well, we will see whether Ju and Jun is intending that of course e4 e5 there's plenty of ways to move around and that opening sh it, it might not be a, a, a lopez it might not be a berlin it might be something like a petrov and uh, there we see juanjun the big question and of course this is the last time that leighting j will have the white pieces in a classical game tomorrow is the final classical game and there it is juanjun's turn and that's an interesting scenario as well, because in the final game of the classical match, <laughs> do, you, do you just want to go into an even match with your opponent having the white paces and being able to control the pace of the game? Yeah, that's a tricky one. Absolutely. I think uh, Lei Tingche will obviously try to, to play this game hard. But, you know, no matter what happens, he's... Women are such strong players. You can't bet against a playoff there. I mean, I, I got to imagine it's like a two to one chance that we are going to see that playoff. I mean, two to one in favor. Um, so mm -hmm. just because they, they both play so well, and there's even the possibility that if Lei Tingche were to win this game, Ju and Ju would hit back and force a playoff anyway. So I think that there's a very high chance that we're going to be here for um, a few few mornings in a row, Jovi, which is music <laughs> to my ears. But uh, hey, uh, a combative game um, is going to take place today. There haven't been quick draws here in this match at all, Jovi. And I mean, 
Um, does that surprise you that there haven't been any kind of like repetitions in the opening just to kind of get an extra day of rest or something like that? Um, to be honest, yes, it does surprise me that uh, they've played on and really drawn out the game as long as it can possibly go. Because there have been some games where it just felt like the players should just make eye contact and say, let's let's just call, call it a day here. But no, they've kept the game on and almost played to the very end with just kings on the board. And there we are. We're going to see a handshake. And we are about to set off let's go oh i can't wait for the surprises to start rolling and, yes uh, lating jay pausing maybe the surprise is actually going to come from lating jay no, no okay no 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 i think it's going to be double king pawn i that that's my prediction let's see there it is yes it is a double, double king pawn and let's see if uh, Lighting Chain now goes for the Ray Lopez or the, the Joko Piano, which was the game, the one game that she won was in a Joko Piano. What do you think, Joby? We're going to find out in just a few seconds. Yeah, C we certainly are. C4 or B5? Bishops. Yeah, exactly. Where to put that light square bishop. And uh, as you mentioned, it was in game five where she won with the Italian. And yep, there it comes again on the board. Hey, that was her one win, you know, like, uh, fine, try it again, right? Maybe you'll win the exact same game. <laughs> and uh, we are seeing knight f6 is uh, d3 played. Now let's see where Juwen Jun is going to deviate, because, of course, I think from a psychological point of view, playing an opening, um, which was from the one game that you win, has the advantage of making your opponent maybe feel some unpleasant memories. And already we see a deviation because in that game five that Lei Ting Shei won, Bishop C5 was played. Here, Ju Wen Jun is playing um, Bishop E7. More solid. Yeah, uh, definitely more solid. And uh, as you said, it's all about, you know, keeping your opponent on the toes. And there you see Ju Wen Jun, she has deviated Bishop E7. And now is the time for Lei Ting Jie to consider what she has prepared. It's quite funny with Lei Ting Jie. Normally when she's surprised somewhat, she pauses and then she reels off her. <laughs> A whole long line of theory. And I have to say, a lot of the theory that she's employing is quite topical as well. So she's really keeping abreast of the trends. Yeah. And here she is. Um, I mean, I reckon she's going to castle or... Um, yeah. C3 is, is a move as well. But I mean, it's, it's like very likely to transpose because, of course, we're castling kingside here as well. So many moves. I mean, I, I find that this <laughs> this opening itself is just one of the most complex openings around. I've always struggled to handle it, and I, I say this quite openly. And I, it's it's due with the fact that it's, the play is very cagey. I mean, White has a whole load of plans at their disposal. You mentioned one, just getting the king to safety. We also have ideas of c3 and uh, rerouting the bishop back to c2 and trying to get d4 in at the right time. There's other ideas of going c3 and going b4 and just expanding on the queen side. This is also very popular. You can also put the knight on c3 if you fancy a solid game, although you have to make sure that this bishop on c4 stays alive. So, yeah, and, and a big question here is, can black get in d5 in a profitable way? Because I think that's what often determines whether black gets equality or in some cases they can get even more, right? So it's interesting to me that white in these types of Joko pianos usually plays for that more luxurious setup of going c3 and then going for d4 or b4, which is really beautiful structurally. But if the position opens up, sometimes it's black that has more development. It exactly, and uh, and has more space as well. And uh, there was some advice given to me by a grandmaster, and he, he said to me, yeah, I understand these positions are super complicated, but he said, basically, at the end of the day, <laughs> 10 moves down the line, it's gonna come down to who has the better light squared bishop. 
and he said even even if the bishop finds itself on c2 okay and a knight c3 played by lady j and uh, this is the third most popular move and the critical thing for white here is that white must remember to keep this bishop on c4 alive so for instance when d6 comes knight to a5 is now a serious positional threat this is white's great pieces great piece and that's why you see a4 played right that makes sense so it, what what jovi is saying is that if um, no d6 um, you can't play knight a5 because knight takes e5, right? So d6 right. really has a little bit of a positional threat because um, I love that uh, quote from your grandmaster friend, and I'm definitely going to steal it. And, but if you don't have a bishop on c4, then you can't, if your bishop on c4 goes, then you can't have a better light squared bishop, right? Exactly. And so, uh, even when it, it's so funny, you know, because even when it finds itself on c2, you know, you're still preparing c3, d4, and you're still... 10 moves down the line it's all going to be about the power of that bishop and we actually saw it this was one of the reasons why Lei Tingjie beats Ju Wenjun and uh, just to kind of rewind a little bit and just to kind of emphasize the points about uh, knight c3 d6 yeah so you could not play knight a5 immediately as Jennifer highlighted because knight takes pawn or just simply win white material so that's why d6 was played just to overprotect e5 and uh, after a4, the bishop has a little hidey hole on a2 and it's safe. And play is continuing with castles. Castles, okay. And, and you know, you mentioned that uh, light squared bishop. And now let's talk about the light squared bishop on c8. I mean, g4 can be a very attractive square for that bishop, which uh, is particularly effective with the white knight on c3, right? Because you don't have the knight on d2 to protect your colleague on f3. So I um, I wonder here if uh, black can play bishop g4 right away and what Lei Ting Che has in mind against that move. Is there going to be um, I'm an h3 and uh, yeah. g4 h idea? H3 is actually castle, the main yeah? move. Uh, yeah, okay. so I'm just checking the database and because uh, <laughs> this is not my speciality and I can see that white has three major moves. So number one choice is right up your street, Jan, and it's just simply just to go h3 and stop that bishop coming to g4. And this is often a trick that we see employed in lower levels, so especially in junior chess. So say, for instance, you were to castle, you see this so often, <laughs> I'm sure you, and then the bishop comes out to g4 and then say, I don't know, say black copies, then this is awkward as anything. And you don't want to ruin your kingside pawn structure. So just uh, one to bear in mind. And if you don't want to engage in any of this, these shenanigans, then simply the main move is just to play h3. Yeah, just play h3. h3 and Exactly, just to stop the idea once and for all. And Black's most popular response is actually to dive in and play bishop e6 and challenge the light square bishop. Now, one important thing to point out here is that the reason white plays h3 now so often as opposed to a move prior is that he, white really wants to castle now. It's like time to castle. And if, as yeah. you mentioned, if castles um, bishop g4, h3, bishop h5, you don't really want to play g4 as much because your king is on that side of the board, right? So uh, whereas if you're not castled, this line playing for like g4 would be pretty attractive, right? Because you haven't committed your king to the king side castling yet. So keep that in mind. This is th These are the little nuances that go behind um, the openings that if you're just looking at the database, you might not quite understand. Like why h3 now and not the move before, right? Exactly. No, that's a really good point. H3, keep the king flexible. Um, another move that has been played before, so we might see this from Lady J, and it is again an eye trendy idea, and she is well on top of the, the trends. And so after a4 castles, uh, it is possible to kind of see space, kind of play like the alpha zero style of chess, which is like play on the wings with a5, and your idea comes into play that bishop g4, then you can meet that with h3, and after here you can always lock the position down with g4 and 
there's just no breakthrough for black and uh, well that uh, would certainly be a battle I wonder what uh, Lei Ting J has up her sleeve yeah well let's see we're gonna find out quite soon after castles um, she's thinking so H3 is that we expected you also mentioned the move a5 um, mm -hmm. castles were, were wondering if bishop g4 with the positional threat of knight d4 is a bit too nagging so yeah. what's your prediction jovi what, what do you think i think we're gonna see h3 i think we'll see h3 um i just also want to say that castles is possible but you do have to take measures against a, a knight plopping into d4 after the bishop comes into g4. As long as you take care of that idea, then castles is possible. So just to kind of say, say Lei Ting J, just castles the king. It's the second most popular move. Then after the bishop comes to g4, knight d4 is a really big threat. So that's why white tends to play bishop e3, sorry, h3 first. Let me get my move order right. So bishop g4 h3 first and then after here bishop e3 just to be able to capture on d4 when a knight comes or be able to go g4 so dynamic stuff and uh if oh i don't know how, how much of, you, of the match you've been following but one thing that's been really funny for all of us to see is that Lei J, <laughs> she barely uses any time in the opening and often we've gotten to move 10, 11 and she's got more time than she started with so it's quite funny to see that the reverse is true. It's now Ju Wenjun <laughs> who has more time than she started with and this is a good sign because I think Knight C3 was certainly a surprise to Ju Wenjun but she's just okay fine she has it all under control. Yeah, it's been another revelation, and I have been following. I mean, just fantastic commentaries you've been doing here, Jovi, with uh, with Danya, with Judith Polgar, and of course with uh, the chess queen herself, Alex Danner, Kostin Yuk. Um, another revelation is just uh, Lei Ting Che's expressions. I know people are falling in love with her expressive face and how she conveys her feelings about the position. So not a poker face, right, Jovi, from <laughs> Lei Ting Che. But you mustn't underestimate Lei Ting Jay because one of my favorite moments was during the press conference. They they asked the, the players, like, how truthful are you being here? And uh, Ju Wenjun looked taken aback and then she thought about it and then she said, okay, 99.9% .9 truthful. And uh, Lei Ting Jay kind of looks and gives one of her famous expressions and then goes, mm, 50%. <laughs> 50%. <laughs> I gotta tell you that's really hard. There's, there's a, there's yeah. a really, there, there, it's hard to be to lie as much as you tell the truth. I, I know this from playing games like you know whether it's mafia, whether it's poker. Uh, it's usually a way easier to tell the truth, right? Like it's so difficult to lie, but perhaps not in in chess press conferences. Apparently, that is the one exception. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that is true. Actually, I, I think you can. It's easier to lie if you you like you just uh, litter the lie with some truths, and then you can you can build your story. But to kind of just tell lies, that's quite difficult. And you know, I I I brushed up for this. I brushed up on my body language 101. And apparently when you look to the right, you're just imagining things. When you look to your left, uh, yeah, look to the left, you're just uh, remembering things. If you look right and down, that means you're low on self-confidence and right and up, you're telling an outright lie. And, uh, <laughs> but, but uh, also one of the things I forgot to mention in my intro is that Jen, you are uh, like, a, you are one of the best poker players around. So I guess you are looking at these small little like body language tells. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that it, it is fascinating because we always talk about having a, a poker face, but having a chess face, what exactly does that mean? I, I mean, I think it means um, really kind of giving yourself that opportunity to focus, right? 
and also intimidating your opponent. So even mm -hmm. though Gary Kasparov had one of the worst poker faces around, everyone would agree that he had the best chess face. Yeah, he, he he was certainly had this aura at the board of confidence of that he really wanted to win. And I actually got that impression when I bumped into Anatoly Karpov as well one time in the Bundesliga. I was he was there in the lift and I was just like, oh, look, and he, I could see that when he was looking at me because I, I got out of the wrong floor that he was just assessing me and just going, what an idiot. <laughs> You got out on the mezzanine and the ground floor is, and you, you I, I can imagine just sitting at the board against these players was quite an intimidating prospect. I think Judith was saying the same that, you know, she, you felt that they were always playing for the win. And yes, uh, as uh, I saw that in chat, there's absolutely no way that Leighton J didn't come to this position not knowing she's just simply choosing what line to play and uh, she picks bishop g5 and let's have a look at that one it's been played a few times before not the most standard idea especially with the bishop on e7 but it is possible yeah so that is a bit surprising that wasn't one of the top few moves that we expected do keep in mind that Perhaps bishop e7 came as a bit of a surprise, as bishop c5 in the fourth move was played by Jun Wen Jun in their fifth game, game battle. So yeah, bishop d 5 does strike me as a little bit surprising, because as you pointed out, it's not a pin, right? The bishop on e7 um, protects the knight on f6. Uh, but I, I wonder if, like, you know, it's a bit of a waiting game here, right? So now with bishop g4, we haven't castled kingside yet. So h3 bishop h5 g4 is still on the menu so it does. just kind of a little bit of a waiting game here as you try to figure out where your opponent is going to develop her light square bishop yeah i i totally uh, agree um, bishop g4 h3 and uh, the same kind of question comes into play especially in this type of pawn structure i, I remember reading this very old book by max erver called the middle game i can't remember it's part one part two but uh, he he talks about this pawn structure and he talks about how it's all to do with the flexibility and the pawn breaks. Like for instance, you have d3, d4, that's one, and then you have f2, f4. And one of the downsides of um, putting the bishop on g5 is say you have complete control over d4, you can actually get complete control over f4 as well. And if you can manage this with some even going h6 and uh, g5, then then you have like a nice grip on the position. Everything is to do with control and stopping those pawn breaks. And it's exactly the reverse for, if, if that's the case for black, it's also the case for white. These two sides are looking at breaking out. So black can do it, also do it with bishop e6 as well, trying to yeah. open up the line. Yeah, bishop e6 looks like a really um, enticing move. Um, but it knight oh, five for white in the chat. Well, that would not be a good move because if knight five, bishop e seven takes e seven. A little yeah. switchback tactic. But that said, it is black's move, so it's black to play. And uh, what are you predicting? You're predicting bishop e six. That's a move. Bishop e six. Bishop g four. I, I'm predicting something I, I i have to confess i, I again these these positions are very very complicated because when the bishop is not in e7 you're always thinking get, about getting bishop e6 in and sometimes you do it immediately and sometimes you prepare it you put a rook on e8 and you go bishop e6 and then you try to take on on e6 with a piece but here it would be an interesting idea just to compare completely challenge the light squared bishop and uh, as you as mentioned by you we have to show this idea that knight d5 maybe not the best idea because you have these uh, knight takes d5 ideas and this person is loose you could easily drop a piece for instance after bishop takes bishop and oops the knight ret retreats backwards and captures the bishop that's a very important tactical idea to have up your sleeves and to be aware about it at all times and we're not going to see that so bishop e6 it's a 
again, an interesting dilemma. Do you capture the bishop or do you just let that bishop stand firm on c4 and instead just make a move like castles and say, well, if you're going to trade, bishop takes bishop. So say, for instance, here, I have the analysis board and, and the players are thinking we have our ideas like this. Now, keep in mind also that there are sometimes some moves uh, with that bishop on g5. It could be tactically uh, vulnerable, right? You always have to look at a move yeah. like knight takes e4, right? With the idea that if bishop e7, knight takes e3, and there's this flurry of exchanges that in this case would be good for black. But you did see the bar go up and down. Why is that? Why do you think that is, chat? Try to figure it out <laughs> yourself. Uh, but and, and, well, I'll tell you, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> if we go back a few moves, you got to keep in mind the fact that all captures are possible. So if knight e4, white can play knight takes e4, and now that bishop on, e, on g5 is protected twice, and white just goes up a piece. But it's a tactical device that you got to be really aware of. Because, for instance, if black plays h6, and you play bishop h4, hey, maybe this line suddenly works for the black pieces. Yeah, and uh, we could very well see this because we do see bishop e6 being played. So we could see a move like after castles. I, th I think that's kind of typical of Lei Tingjie. She uh, plays very direct chess. After h6, that is the big question, right? Do you step back with the bishop? Because, sorry, hang on, bishop takes bishop. I, I should... I'm, uh, I'm I'm kind of a newbie at controlling the board, so you'll have to bear with me. <laughs> Knight takes oh, bishop, yeah. takes bishop, and whoops, a daisy. Okay, the pawn takes bishop, and now h6. It's well, right. Is, so is your tactic in play? I think it is. Uh, bishop h4, knight takes e4. I think uh, is in play, yeah. So I think bishop takes f6 and knight d5 might be something that we see in, instead. Or, of course, you could also retreat the bishop the other way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But where? Yeah. Because bishop e3 allows the nagging knight g4, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think probably I like your idea of just going bishop takes knight and then just sticking a knight into d5. And... And then piling up on the half open D line. If this, it feels like this is quite a nice position for white, at least it's easy to play. Yeah, more comfortable for white. Remember, very, very close positions often favor those knights. And here there would be not a single pawn traded, um, very close, very attractive for the white knight on D5, as opposed to that bishop on F6, which is no great shakes. And uh, I just saw a question in, in chat asking about these double pawns. And yeah, optically, you know, you always judge double pawns, not necessarily by how they look, but whether they can move. And yeah, they can't move. But there's something more at stake, and that is the half open D line. And also access for this knight to D5. So you can just imagine a scenario where the queen does move to E2, the rook comes to D1, and then there's a nice pressure. And uh, let's not forget that this knight also has some flexibility. Oh, and what are we seeing? I think we saw bishop takes bishop played. So let me just refresh and get to... Oh no, bishop takes knight played. And after bishop takes knight, knight to d5. So a similar idea, but uh, again, Leiting J keeping the question open. What is she going to do with the king? Right. Well, yeah, that, it is quite instructive about to see how she delays castling here. Um, I don't want my son to see this game. <laughs> my six-year-old <laughs> is getting super into chess, and uh, he, he sometimes forgets to castle, though. But when the great players do it, they always have a really good reason. And here we, we noticed that a big reason for delaying castles was just to make that bishop g4 move less saucy, right? Mm-hmm. Definitely. And yeah, that, that's the problem with modern day chess, right? Is that no one is castling. They're all kind, kind of doing king f1 and h4. But you know, they're getting out the rook in some ways. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I would often advise that 
not necessarily against it, but you know, you need to think about how you're going to connect the rooks. And it's not just about king safety. And uh, knight d5 played. And it's an interesting kind of dilemma. Well, not dilemma, but a uh, it's kind of scenario on the board because I'm wondering what uh, Lady J's idea is. You know, does she want to just simplify the position, clarify it because she's looking ahead to the playoffs? Because not that many games left. And also, is she trying to gain something with the knight coming to d5? Because at the very least, Ju and Jun could just say that knight on d5 is just very strong and I'm gonna get rid of it, which is something I would be tempted to, to say as well. And then we would have a situation with opposite color bishops on the board. What do we, what do we think about that? Or do yeah, you, are you a big fan of the bishop pair and maybe you want to go bishop e7? I am a big fan of the bishop pair, but this particular bishop on e7 is um, not one that you're going to really be as happy about. I, I do think that there's a very high chance for a playoffs, Jovi, not just because of this opening, but just because of the players. I mean, think about it. If you're confident, you're a great player, and I think both of these la ladies are very confident that they are going to win the match. And so mm -hmm. you want to take it to a playoff so that you, you get more games, right? The more games, the better player is more likely to win. So I, I, don't, I don't necessarily think they're playing for quick draws, but I think they both have this attitude for different reasons. Lei Tingche, because she's in great form, because she's young and hungry. Ju Wen Jun, because she's won so many championships. She knows what it's like to be under stress and win anyway. They both think, I can do it if I get into the playoff. I think there's a high chance that both of them are looking forward to that rather than dreading it. And I think that's the key to their championship success, that you don't fear that stress, you embrace it. Yeah, that's that's very, very key. But uh, at the same time, it I, this is the Women's World Championship match. And of course, there's like a battle on every single level because Lei Ting Jane might be happy with the playoffs, but Ju Wen Jun might not be. Let's say she, she might be, you know, we've seen her time and time again, just extend the game and just say, you know, if she has a small advantage, she will press it through. She wants to tire out her young opponent, maybe make her nervous. I, 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 how do you kind of cope with all the mind games and all the overthinking that goes on. Yeah, well, I mean, right now they're they're focused on this game, uh, but the chat is asking a lot of questions about the possibility of that playoff. Um, yes, it would be a day after the 12th game at the same time, um, and it would be a very lengthy battle because it would start with four rapid games, and um, yeah, it would, it would be quite a treat to see that. I think yeah. that uh, if if we see that, we're going to be in for some really crazy chess and and, and huge surprises. Um, somebody just asked. Yeah. Um, um, I thought that we wanted to keep the light square bishops on the board. Yeah. So there the, there there is that, that there is that issue, but uh, that was in the traditional kind of italian and here we have a kind of different situation so now you know the rules you do have to be a bit flexible with your thinking and you have to just uh, basically assess the value of this knight is this knight on d5 going to be a thorn in your side if it is you get rid of it i i, I tend to always believe in being possessive about your own half and <laughs> you say the the first four rows they belong to white <laughs> the, the eight and five black can have them and then you just Fight for those squares with all you can. And if a piece enters there, you have to assess whether it's dangerous, whether you can play around it. And this is the big thing that Ju Wenjun is considering. Because, yeah, it is It is true. You do want to keep your light square bishop on the board. But if this knight is going to be an inconvenience, a hassle, after all, it's threatening this bishop on f6. And this bishop on f6 might have all the potential. There's also the possibility, you know, that this knight is just simply tying down also the, the c6 knight. So you can kind of also, again, see a situation that after bishop takes bishop, bishop takes. That there's a lot more freedom in black's position. Say, for instance, you want to go queen to d7, or you can step the king out and then 
perhaps prepare some kind of F5 pawn breaks. There's also um, just a freestyling here, but you know, if you do want to chase away that bishop, you can first of all protect the b7 pawn, or maybe you don't even need to, and just go knight to e7 and start driving white black back. And then it's all about creating those targets and creating the momentum. But certainly, it's going to be all about the long term. That's a really and, interesting uh, position, Jovi, because I, I think the bishop on, on d5 is excellent here. It's a beautiful bishop, but the problem is that it's not really supported by any of uh, its colleagues, right? Right. So it's just like you can't really harmonize to do anything with it. And then you have you have all these great ideas of like king h8, you know, bishop e7, f5, knight e7. So yeah, kind of an instructive position that just, well, I guess it's the opposite of what your grandmaster friend said. Your bishop is, is yeah. great, but you can't do much about it. Exactly. Also, you know, I, I just there's one game in the database and they got to this position and they, they just went knight e7. So for instance, knight e7, so the bishop takes b7. Yeah, okay, it might be a move. But after rook to b8, the b2 pawn is dropping. And of course, the bishop can't go back to d5 because the knight is covering that square. So mm. there's all sorts of ideas in the air and when it comes to bishops of opposite color uh, so for instance if you don't take on b7 and instead you drop the bishop back to a2 it's going to be all about the power of the bishop just as my grandmaster friend said you know if it's a good piece then great it, white will be better but if it's a bad piece i was not doing anything then and um, black finds a way to kind of maybe go king h8 or g6 bishop g7 and try to get I don't, I, you know, f5 in, I'm a big fan of f5, or maybe he's trying to get for c6 or d5, or just block out this bishop, then there's no reason why white is better. So very, yeah. very interesting position so far. And everyone's asking who that GM friend is. <laughs> well, it's funny, Joby, because when, when you said grandmaster this time, I thought you said grandma. Uh, you're about to say, like, my, my grandma yeah. said that. <laughs> and, and, and if you think about it, how many how many uh, grandmasters are there who are also grandmas? I mean, I, I'm not totally sure. that but definitely a few. The, the, the Georgian women, for sure. There's got to be a couple there, I think, like Nona. Uh, but uh, no. Just really, yeah. Are, are, do, are you going to tell us who this uh, grandmaster is? Okay, I, I, can, uh, I can say it's a co-commentator. So there oh. you go. You got a long list. All right. And he's right. very good. He's very good at the e four u five position. So I, I will let you. I will let you uh, all come to the conclusion. I've already told you it's a he. So clues, clues abound. <laughs> Chat, kind of get it. Okay, we got. Ging we got si Ginger Simon. GM. Simon. Okay. Uh, Ginger GM would be like Grandmaster Franz recommends h two h four. <laughs> <laughs> and then you then you know actually simon is a great guy to follow if you just want to kind of if, if you need to improve sharpen your play and everyone is going how maybe <laughs> maybe not uh, no he's an exceptional player and he's off to uh, play in the world cup i think that's happening in a few days time and so we we will all wish him the best of luck it would be awesome right if uh, our very own david howell goes through and gets a spot and the candidates and here we see uh ju wen june a close-up on ju wen june as she looks to uh gain equality in this game does she already have it the question as the opening has um seen a lot of very very solid play yeah, GM Canty is... says Charlie. <laughs> J Dog. <laughs> uh, Canty, an awesome guy, and uh, yeah, nine moves in, and big decision for Ju Wen Jun. Does she trade that knight in the middle of the board, or does she let it stand and preserve her bishop pair? Well, that is Ju Wen Jun's question. And one question that we will have to wait until after the break to get it answered. So don't go anywhere. You won't want to miss this game 11 game match. Okay, see you in a few minutes.
This course is about white playing d4, all the tools you need to get an advantage with white and not be tricked early in the opening. Now it has a really long, complicated name that I'm gonna mispronounce now, so you can make fun of me. Okay, don't make fun of me too much. I'm, I'm trying to help you here. It's called the Chelyabinsk variation, and I'm probably mispronouncing Chelyabinsk. That's why I call it the A6 slot. Oh my goodness, 98? Whoa. Bishop G5 with no me. No way! It has to give it to me! 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 He blew it me! Chance, look, F7. Oh, whoa! No! 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 I didn't think about uh, winning or defending the goal. I just think uh, we're still a strong team and uh, hopefully we can play our best.
And we are back, and there we see Ju Wenjun, the current women's world champion, and not just the world champion, she's also three time back to back women's world champion. First, winning the title in 2018, and then defending her title just a few months later in a completely different format in the Knockout World Championship. And then she defended her title against the young upcomer Alexandra Goryachkina. And now she's here in Chongqing, this amazing mega city to do it all again and she has the black pieces this is game 11 and there with five points apiece nothing can separate her from her challenger but in this position still a big decision to be made and we see Ju Wanjun in thought as to whether she should remove that knight from d5 take it off the board or should she find another way to handle the position and perhaps preserve that bishop pair and we see her deep in thought and one of the things about Ju Wanjun and also Lei Ting Jie, I have to say is that both women they use their time very wisely. They consider all their options. She's not afraid to burn 20 minutes on making a decision. We also saw in game 10 how she used 20 minutes to actually take back a move. She retreated her knight to back where it, to it, came, where it came from and it was in fact the best move. And well, it's all gonna hinge on who has the better bishop as we see there from chat. Well, I think also something about this position, which really struck me when you were showing the variations at bishop e5, bishop takes d5, it really struck me that it's actually the white knight on f3 that's not that good. Uh, because, mm. you know, you see the knight on c6, e7, d4 potentially in, in some positions, whereas the knight on f3, like, what does it do? Like, if you could catapult it to f5, you know, maybe that would be nice. Uh, but it, it really doesn't do a, a heck of a lot on f3 and that's one of the reasons why despite the beautiful light squared bishop white doesn't have a lot of juice in this position mm -hmm. yeah it, it's definitely very very tense for instance like you say you know this is something that ju and jun will be evaluating you know the strength of the pieces and also the long-term prospects because don't forget the position is very close and if you do step back with a knight to e7, then you you know White's plan could be d4, could be f4, could be expanding as far as they go on the queen side. You know, these are the things that are just whirling through Ju Wanjun's head. Also, she could be thinking if we go back to the game position that actually she quite likes the bishop pair, and she might be looking at moves like g6. She might even be thinking, well, if you can put your knight on d5, this is the computer's top suggestion, by the way, just to put the knight on d4. <laughs> hey. I mean, this is also a, a plan. And with our familiar friend of putting the bishop on g4. And uh, yeah, take your time, Ju Wenjun. Make the correct decision. Make the decision. In, in this particular situation, it has to be a decision that favors your style and that you're going to be most comfortable with. And uh, Ju Wanjun now to under one hour and 10 minutes on the clock. And we just only played nine moves. We got a question from the chat that they missed the start. What opening was this? Well, it is a Joko Piano that we had today. The same game, or the same opening, that is, that Lei Ting Che won her sole victory of the match so far in game five. This one, however, um, has shaped out a little bit differently because Ju and Ju deviated as early as move four. So uh, yeah. that's the opening we have today. I, I think she's going to play Bishop takes d5. That's my prediction uh, because some of those positions that you were showing us, um, Jovi, did look quite um, fun for Black without a lot of worries. And um, we should point out because I noticed that a lot of players make mistakes um, of all levels, but particularly um, newer players. They make mistakes when there are options of captures, right? So after bishop yeah. takes d5, some people might think, I should take with the pawn and attack that knight on c6. Free tempo, right? But yeah. you, you get one tempo, but at the cost of that light squared bishop on c4 um, forever 
being weakened. And Joby's grandmaster friend would be very disappointed here in the Bishop on C4. <laughs> and they would be using the British very, very disappointed. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just love making that a sound. <laughs> if you want to sound super smart or super funny and Jennifer you called it and I, I was actually just going to piggyback on your point and I I was going to say you know one of Ji Wanjin's strengths as well as her weaknesses is that often she will trade pieces she can't quite handle the tension in certain positions and her instinct is to make that capture and it's happened and uh, we didn't see knight e7 which was the game where uh, that was I had there on my database, but instead Ju Wenjun has played the more active bishop to b4 with very much the same idea. And Ju right. Wenjun, not, not Ju Wenjun, but Lei Ting I can just see in the camera. She's just like looked to the clock and she looked to that direction and she was like, "What is that knight doing in my half?" Uh, it was unexpected. Else, unexpected to me. I, I was expecting knight e7, but knight b4 played quickly and uh, bishop takes pawn is not going to happen i can guarantee that because rook to b8 and questions will be asked about this b2 pawn and the light squared bishop will disappear from the board it's not really what you want so i'm no. expecting bishop b3 right bishop b3 and that does ask the knight on b4 well you are going to be ousted with the move like c3 in uh you know in, in quick succession. So bishop e3 followed by c3. And then what is your plan for that knight on b4? You, you kind of just have to go back to c6, right? Because a6 doesn't look like that exciting of a square. So I, I'm actually happy might be about- the idea though. It could to go be. a6 and go c5. Right, but it seems like because... we're gonna gain so many tempi is white, right? Because we're gonna get d4 in at some point too. Hmm. Oh, well, this is exciting, isn't it? So hang on a second. So say we go, I, I don't know. I don't know what to do, but you don't want to put your knight back to c6. That's this. Because <laughs> otherwise, otherwise white's kind of, kind of got this bishop on b3 just for free. Uh, so say we go knight a6, just to go knight c5. And after and c3, and this so knight, and uh, what is happening here? Right, this that... is the idea, and this is where this is where we've I've been advised by uh, Dania, by Alexandra and Judith. They say when the pawn structure is about to change or is changing, this is the perfect moment to leave the board to take a break. Had, have you heard about this advice, Jennifer? Or is it to me? It was a surprise. I did I didn't know that this is the moment where you get up, get a breather, splash some water on your face come back to the board and just go, right, I've zoomed out, I've refreshed the screen, reset everything, and uh, I'm now willing to play the position that is on the board. Well, hey, if, if uh, Alexandra, Juden, and Danya all recommend it, then it's gotta be some pretty pretty fantastic advice. That's uh, quite a trio there, Jovi. Um, I love the advice, I love it. And, uh, the, the thing here is my first instinct was like, I like this for white because we're going to get to play d4 with a tempo, but not so fast because our king is in the center. So we do have to be a little bit cautious, right, about getting that right away. Like, can you imagine even if like black plays, well, I could play rookie eight and just stop you. But even if even if c6, it, it could be that there's like a really fun variation. And after d4, we could just take on d4 and then take on e4 and play rookie eight. Uh, talk, talk, talk about flashing some water on your face. <laughs> that would be quite the rude shock. Okay, so Bishop takes knight. This is the idea. Then Rook to e8. And uh, whoops, when you try to defend that bishop, say maybe move you with the queen or the knight, then d5 will simply come. And this bishop on e4 will fall because the rook is pinning the king. Yeah, but this is the kind of thing that white could stumble into and always good to have these ideas in the back of your mind and lay putting the jacket back on she means business and she will have to play in a business frame of mind if she wants to defeat ju wenjun ju wenjun such a good player so yeah so c6 i agree with you d4 not possible you'll have to wait for that one to 
<laughs> one more move. And I'm a big advocate, just like you were saying, Jan, of castling, get the king to safety. Right, yeah, especially now that it looks like the position's gonna open up, right? Like we were delaying it when the pawn breaks weren't so obvious, but now that like D5 is, is coming at us fast, um, we certainly have to get our, our king into safety. Yeah. So. And it's but, such a, such a tense, but I mean, I, I keep using the word tense, but that's the only word I can think of about these things because, you know, it's all going to hinge on pawn breaks, pawn expansions. The position is still very close. It's not, again, clear whose bishop is better. So if there's knight standing pretty on c5, I, I would be tempted to kind of go b4, a5, but then you're abandoning d4 ideas and, oops, forget that arrow. And yeah, but you can also see situations where the knight can drop back to e6 and then this bishop also gets out of the way of uh, an f5 pawn expansion and still anything can happen um, but maybe oh, by the way i'm obsessed i'm obsessed with f5 <laughs> yeah i think right. a lot of us have tendencies or biases towards certain things and one of mine is simply pushing <laughs> pushing in the center or pushing f5 yeah and i mean I, it's just so multi-purpose right jovi i mean you not only uh, the center but you also get that rook into the game it just feels so glorious right yeah and but then i also just uh, looked over and i saw that the computers are advocating a different plan for black and that's based on the idea of going g6 and h5 simon our ginger gm friend will be very happy with ideas like this again taking space and i guess the idea is to put the knight on e6 and then go to knight f4 wow i love and that holding holding firm the center which again is very attractive and okay well we do have a move so i am just gonna refresh and bishop b3 was played and yeah we see chat i've never had a grandmaster friend yeah i have a few grandmaster friends so let's try to drop name drop them when we can it's uh, one of the privileges well they'll be name dropping you as well jovi so you yeah, know it goes both ways it goes both ways uh but this position the king will not go both ways this is only a castling king side position we're not going to see any queen side castles for white in this in this case uh but is black's move uh do we just move our knight back voluntarily here with knight a6 or do we wait for you to play c3 i mean i would probably wait for you to play c3 and do something like c6 or, um, yeah. well, c6 or, or a5 even, maybe? a5 just to get more space once we play knight a6. By the way, I love your g6 h5 idea. That That's awesome. I mean, it's not a super typical idea in this type of structure, but because of the bishop on f6, you see that it's like hard to play h4 and stop the h5 h4 idea especially once we've castled kingside um and I, I really like how that plan shows you how important it is to have different ideas in your arsenal right because you know if you um if you only have a hammer well every problem looks like a nail right so this idea of king h8 and f5 is really really cool but then you also have this idea of g6 and h5 and suddenly you become like an, a great player because you're looking at d5, f5, and h5. You're looking at all the aggressive plans. Now that, that's, yeah. that's really great. <laughs> and uh, talking about having different weapons in your arsenal, uh, well, we saw g6, h5. That, was, that wasn't my idea, that was a computer idea, but I loved it as well. And it was, again, very relevant when the center is stable. And talking about stable center, well, Ju Wenjun, she has released the tension. She has made her breakthrough by playing d5. And immediately after that move, Lei J, she gave us a frown. She, perhaps a surprise to her. So d5, I guess. I guess Lei J just thought maybe it wasn't possible on account of c3. But this is where the idea of counterattacking 
comes into play because mm. after C3, yeah, if you're forced to kind of retreat the knight, then oh, oh, you lose protection of D5. But pawn takes pawn is a Ju Wan Jun's idea. And after pawn takes pawn, maybe the knight will come to D3 and give a nice pretty check to the king on E1. And well, we are now in the realm of modern chess, right? <laughs> king has to go to F1. And then I guess you have to kind of go H4 and uh, get your pieces connected that way. H4, G3, King G2, 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 take control of the only open line on the board. And if oh, there's also knight takes, is that knight takes pawn? Like, Did yeah. I just look over and the knight, the computer's yeah. suggesting knight takes pawn. I'm like, what? Can well, you if, really go into no man's land? Well, we do have queen D3 check, right? So if you play queen C2 or queen B1, we just have a queen D3 check, yeah? Oh, yeah. And if you play queen E2, we also have queen D3. So oh, just, wow. Do we, though? Is there a way to trap us here? Huh? Because if I take, if you take on D3 here, the knight escapes with knight takes D3 and we're up upon life is beautiful. Yeah. But what if uh, you just play, I, uh, I don't want to suggest king E1, but I'm trying to find like a, like a waiting move. Right. Hmm. You, you could see a kind of repetition, like queen brick here and then queen, queen e1. No, no, because the knight gets out to d3. No, 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 the knight gets trapped with knight takes, queen takes queen. So you could see a repetition like this. And, right. Okay, okay, but this would be a very rare occurrence in this world championship because these two players do not do quick draws. So... That is why, can I just see a move was played after d5? It's not c3 because of pawn takes pawn, but uh, that is why Leighton J played pawn takes pawn. E takes c5, yeah, yeah, that mm -hmm. makes sense. I mean, that whole line looked very scary, right? Like uh, allowing taking on e4 and knight d3 check, uh, but it was beautiful to look at. But now we have a more, a more sane, more, <laughs> uh, I, I don't want to say sane, intuitive, a more intuitive line here for white to take on d5, not to allow knight d3 check and takes on e4. And uh, knight takes d5, played by black very quickly. Um, and finally the king gets castled as the position opens up. Now see how that happens? When the position is closed, we can delay castling. As soon as it opens up, we gotta get the king out of dodge. Yeah, and uh, Lei Tingjie, she takes our grandmaster's advices and the, the pawn structure has now changed. There's an half open, two half open lines on the board. White will have pressure against the E5 pawn. Black will have pressure along the D line and she gets up and she leaves the board. It's a good idea to always zoom in and zoom out and just to see the bigger picture for a while. And, well, who is more comfortable? That is the question. White has a very nice bishop on b3, pointing at f7. Black has the space. It's got the further advanced pawn with e5. So that controls those square, not that one, those two squares. Knight that can jump into f4. And has better flexibility the queen can come up to the goldilocks squares of d6 i always like to kind of a queen on this the sixth row or for white the third row is really good well placed and uh, my grandmaster friend this time i will name drop neil mcdonald he called it the goldilocks squares and he'd been studying lots of computer games computer games computer chess and the computer the engines were always putting the queen on like d6 and the reason why it's goldilocks because the queen can actually go forward from this square all the way up the board and she has the ability to switch from the left to the right very very easily yeah that's a great point i love that i love that phrase the goldilocks squares because it's uh active the queen loves to be active but it's not so exposed that it's going to get hassled too much very very well mm -hmm. well said i'm going to remember that that's a, that's a really nice one by the way, I'm only one hearing grandma when you talk about your grandmaster friends. You cannot master without grandma. 
<laughs> grandma. Am I saying grandma? I could be my grandma friends. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I would love to have a grandma friend who is actually like grandmaster. But yeah. that's, I'm waiting for those days. Um, but now you, you got my mind thinking as to any... Because there, there aren't too many, like, for instance, uh, Elizabeth Pates, she's part of a father-daughter grandmaster duo. And then we have also Vahidov. I think he's part of a, maybe his father's international master. I'm not sure whether his father is a grandmaster, but there aren't too many. And of course, the Van Flores, their brothers, Judith Polga and Susan Polga, the sisters. And yeah not very nice uh, family duos and uh, there we have a comment from fish duality says i prefer white's position ever so slightly but black's position looks so pretty yeah mm. and i completely agree with that and i think on account of that dynamic balance i think the position is level and first thing i would do if i were black is i would just reinforce this stronghold and then i would then contemplate my plans i love i agree but i think i would take the opposite of fish duality um partly because he's got fish in his name and so no no it's okay <laughs> it's all right i think i would take black because i feel like white has a better bishop but black has the better knight and it, it somehow it seems easier for me to play as black and what you said about the goldilocks rank with the queen um, was very appealing to me, whereas there are some unanswered questions for me for white. Um, just feel like it's a tiny bit easier to play for black. So perhaps I would take the black pieces. What about you, Jovi? If you had to pick, would you pick black or white? Um, I think I would pick black, but the words of this grandmaster is always on my head and uh, this bishop is annoying, right? Because I, I kind of want to go Ricky eight, but at the same time, I've always got to watch out on this pr protection of the F7 point. And I, I have a feeling it's just very level. That's my vibe. I'm going to sit on the fence very firmly here. <laughs> I'm saying neither. <laughs> Both sides are happy. Everyone is a winner in the words of the hot chocolate song. And does Black need to improve her bishop somehow? Uh, yes. That is definitely something that Ji Wenjin will have to deal with. Perhaps not now, because this pawn on e5 does need to be protected. But as soon as this knight moves from f3, as soon as the pressure is off, then Ji Wenjun will be looking at improving her bishop. But the, again, you've kind of highlighted it. The bishop doesn't have a... This bishop on f6 doesn't have any great diagonals to go to i guess you know maybe one day go to c5 and then start looking at f2 but that's a big ask i think for now just let it sit on f6 but i have to say i am actually kind of excited that we got this position because if you had asked me just like just a few moves ago i i would think that it would be like the position would be even more um balanced Whereas this one, it might be equal, but there are there are a few imbalances, right? Like the the, the pawn structure is not completely symmetrical. Um, the, I, I talked about the better bishop for white and the better knight for black. Um, the possibility of playing these h5 ideas. So there's a little bit of uh, push and pull in this position, which I might not have expected if, for instance, we just had mass trades on d5 and d4, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, and also we see chat suggesting some moves, g6, bishop g7. I like it. <laughs> I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. I also mm -hmm. quite like the the modern way of playing jazz, which is also about just protecting all your pieces. And you see all these top grandmasters, they literally protect all their pieces and they go, they smile and then they go, look at that. <laughs> protection operation and actually this is a really really good strategy when you're short on time just protect your pieces obviously take care of your king <laughs> can't go just, wrong with that. and i'm sorry i'm just laughing because i just see some roasting going on from our producer bick he's saying my name is grandmaster 
Grandma. <laughs> white fish star. <laughs> Everyone is laughing at the way I'm, I'm saying grandmaster. Okay, I'll, I'll be shorter. I'll stop going grandmaster. No, grandma. <laughs> I love it. I, I think I think it's fantastic. All the grandmas in the chat say hello. By the way, I just saw a little tactic. Um, I don't know if it works because I didn't check it with the computer. But we talked about how the idea of H5 is a good idea. Mm -hmm. I just noticed, well, if H5, does white have knight takes E5? Just every opportunity I can to get a little tactical um, fun in there, I got to check. Yeah, so, so I just uh, go H5 now. And if is, knight takes, is knight takes pawn possible? I was, I was looking, is it possible with the idea that if bishop takes E5, queen H5, and I've got a little skewer minor pieces? It, it does look dangerous. Um, Wow, because I was I was looking at Rook E8, but a Rook E8 would be not a good move because D4. So it is it is definitely a tricky idea, but apparently according to the engine, and it's only the engine that's refuting you, not me. Uh, Bishop takes pawn apparently is the refutation there. That's why it's going up. But definitely ah. a lovely idea, uh, but it's still very much an idea in the position, and Bishop takes and threatening the rook. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. I mean, th this is the thing. I mean, a lot of times these types of tactics don't work. Um, and so uh, the point is to always look at them, not always play them, right? You always want to look at forcing moves and these tactical ideas that you take advantage of loose pieces, but don't always play them. Always look at them. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And even better is if you were to train beforehand and every morning I've been waking up pretty early and I've been doing my t my puzzles, not puzzle rush, but my puzzles on chess.com. And I find that because of that, I'm able to spot things a lot faster than normal. And when I was at my rating peak, it was because I was doing 50 puzzles a day. So, ah, wait, wait, so let me ask you, you mentioned you, you clarify that you weren't doing puzzle rush. You were doing the regular puzzles on chess.com. Yes. Now, uh, why? Why is that? And uh, do you also do puzzles out of a book or on the board? No, just uh, just on uh, on basically on my phone. I get my phone or my iPad whenever I'm on the go. I will try to get my my puzzles in. And yeah, it was after a discussion with some grandmasters at the American Cup and lots of grandmas in the room. And they all said to, and they all said to me that actually doing puzzle rush i mean it's very good it's, it's very helpful but at the same time it's much better just to have that thinking time and of course the more you practice on puzzles the better you get and the better you get the more difficult the puzzles are which means that you know you don't just superficially go for the right answer all the time and you just have thinking time. So at the minute, I'm like 3,300. I don't know if that's good or bad. It sounds good. And yeah, you just do puzzles when you're waiting in line at Disney World. If you're lucky enough to be at Disney World, I'm so jealous, by the way. I do love Disney and especially the fireworks and the castle. Oh, this, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. I've got it. I've got a six-year-old, so he loves that. And by the way, my six-year-old does some puzzle rush and puzzle duel is what they call it on Chess Kid. And uh, I think that my take on it is that it's really good as a um, barometer for like how you're doing. But if you keep doing it and you don't work on your puzzles in some other fashion, um, at some point you're just going to reach your wall. And then you're just repeating yourself, right? So it's like, mm -hmm. it's good to see, have I gotten better? Have I gotten sharper? But then uh, once you kind of reach your your peak, it's time to actually break out some books or do some regular puzzles so that you can continue to grow. Yeah, definitely. And uh, as you mentioned, you know, you also have to like work on all aspects of your game. You can't just work on the on your puzzles. You need to pick what I have this big, uh, big thing that, you know, things that you like, you can do by yourself because you have the impetus you have the drive to do that things that you struggle with find friends you know if you don't like end games okay not some of us don't like end games some of us love them just find your friends and uh, drag them into solving some end game studies or just working through those basics because you, you'll at least enjoy the company you know and i i feel that the emphasis should be on having fun and 
Talking about having fun, we do see that the players have reinforced that stronghold. Ji Wanjun has gone for that modern day principle of protecting every single piece you have so loose pieces don't drop off. Knight is protected on d5, which means that the queen is released from defending duties. And these two rooks, they are, of course, hitting and defending the e5 point. Right, so it's rookie eight, and now it's white's move again. And, you know, what's our uh, equivalent here for our Goldilocks square? Could we, should we stick our queen on d2 to connect our rooks? Um, or c1? No, I don't want to do that. Do we still want to play for c3, or do we want to play for a5? Um, a5 seems like a kind of attractive idea for white, because if I get the opportunity to play a6, maybe it could be compelling. What do you think? I love your A5 idea because it really fits in with modern day chess, you know, because you push your, your wing pawns as far as they can go. And then, then you just sit there and you just play for that long-term advantage in the end game. So say for instance, you get your pawn to A5 and then you visualize an end game where pieces are traded off. And if that knight manages to magically appear on C5, you're like, oh, good times ahead. And it's those small little details that can affect the long-term possibilities. Oh, another thing that I've seen lots of grandmasters, grandmas again, lots of top players do, is, <laughs> is they can try to control the knight circuit. So the knight can jump to f4, so I've seen them go g3 those kind of ideas also i love connecting the rooks uh, definitely this is going to be something that is a matter of taste and uh while well, talking about a matter of taste this is something that will take lei ting jay some time to decide on so it's the perfect break for us just to leave lei ting jay with her thoughts there we see her making those choices and well We'll take a quick break and we will join you because you don't want to miss all the action that is coming up in Game 11 of the Women's World Championship. See you in a few minutes. Your subscription makes shows like this possible, which is why our Twitch subscribers will never see ads on chess.com. Connect your chess.com account and Twitch account at go.chess.com slash connect accounts and bang, boom, voila, you're done. 100% ad-free bliss forevermore. Whether you're following our events on site or on stream, type the command connect in the chat and thank you for helping bring these shows to life. Yeah, there are, there are a few. I mean, one for sure is interviewing the Holocaust survivor in 1956, French women's chess champion, Isabel Schoko. Started out as a podcast for Ladies Night in the Grid. And it turned out that I got a chance to travel to Paris and actually meet Isabel herself. That's a, a little piece that's gonna be coming out on chess.com soon. Oh, that was just magical, I mean, I'm Jewish and you know, seeing the rise of anti-Semitism is, is really disturbing. And to be able to talk to somebody who was almost slaughtered in one of the worst atrocities of all time, but is still living 80 years later and really not just living, but thriving, like providing so much inspiration to everyone around the world. I mean, it's a magical moment. Like this is like one of the reasons why we play chess and why we create art for moments like that. So. I feel uh, really lucky to have met Isabel and thankful for that. Also, another moment that really stands out for me was when Yuda Polgar uh, visited my US Chess Girls Club. We had hundreds of girls there from all over the world. In fact, we had girls from Kenya. We had girls from, you know, obviously the United States, from Colombia. And we also had adult women there as well. Um, so it was a huge turnout. and. 
Judith was just so charming and brilliant in her answers. In particular, I noticed that a lot of girls asked her similar questions on a variation of like, what do you do if your confidence is shattered? What do you do if you lose a few games in a row? If you're scared, if you don't know what to do. And it's funny because Judith's like, reply was so striking to me because she was just like, oh man, this, these questions are tough for me because I've always been so confident. And uh, she didn't manage to reply, but it was interesting to me to see that that was a bit of a struggle for her because she has always had that confidence that she was great. She hasn't suffered from imposter syndrome. And I think that's a big secret to her success and just a reminder of how important confidence is to becoming um, the best chess player that you can be. We're just waiting on Lay's choice here. Oh no! Oh she didn't God, play she that! Didn't... Kudos to Lei Tingjie for a really, really impressive performance. Lei Tingjie has won this match. Huge congratulations, what a performance, great games. And that's it! Resignation! That's oh, wow. it! Lei Tingzhi, the winner of the 2023 Honey Dates Finals. Congratulations to Lei Tingzhi and her supporters. Hello, and we are back in Chongqing, and there we see the challenger Lei Tingjie in action. And what an impressive candidate she has been so far. She's been impressive, actually, throughout the last years. You know, Alexandra Kostanek was reminding us that in 2021, she just had one tournament that she could play, and she chose to play it in the Grand Swiss. She won that one so convincingly. She raced to eight points out of nine. And at the prize giving, she was running around saying, when are the dates for the 2022 candidates? Well, when it came to 22, again, just that one shot. And she won the candidates very convincingly, not needing a tie break. Tie break. And then, of course, in 2023, she defeated her compatriot, also her childhood friend, Tan Zhongyi. And she is sitting in this chair. She has the white pieces for the final time. And... It is definitely very much challenge on for against as she faces against Ju Wen Jun. And well, we left you with Lei Ting J taking a decision as to how she should continue. And she went for Jan's idea of just stepping the queens forward and connecting the rooks, upon which Ju Wen Jun reacted very quickly with the move rook to e7 and it's it's definitely a surprising move and letting jay once again as well making those kind of frowns these grimaces concentrating hard she was also caught unawares 
Yeah, it's funny. Like, if I could just stick a knight on e4 in this position or a knight on c4, I'm really bothered as white by the fact that my knight on f3 is, is so, so uh, unpromising here. Now, that does, of course, give me the idea, now that you've put your rook on e7 and your bishop and your queen are no longer a, a battery against the g5 square, what if I play knight to g5 right now? Um, will you take it, leaving yourself with a knight for a bishop? A white seems like they would have a little something something there, eh? Yeah, I, I agree. And yeah, let's, whilst uh, Leighton J is considering what to play, let's have a look. Knight to g5, improve the worst place piece. I approve. And knight e4 is coming. So that does worry me. So maybe I'm going to resort to a move that chat suggested, which was just to make a hiding place for the bishop, put it on g7. Right, yeah, and then if knight e4, you, just, you stick your bishop on g7, and suddenly my knight on e4, not as stable because you could play for f5. Now f5 does create some weaknesses, but maybe it'll be worth it. And now I, I wonder if I've, uh, if I've overextended. I, I could look at putting my knight on c5 in these positions, but that rook on e7 now protects b7. So it doesn't seem too promising on that square as well. So, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. And maybe that is uh, part of the idea behind rook e7, that uh, you're really well poised to play against this idea. Which does then make that uh, rook e7 is a very impressive idea because she was considering that the knight could come to e4 and thinking ahead to a knight jump to c5. I was just thinking with a rook on e7 she wants to step the queen forward and or oh, maybe even go rook d7. The, I, don't, I, I wasn't quite sure what the idea was but now all has been revealed and I, I like it. So maybe not knight to g5 and what are we seeing? Rook e4. Ooh, wow. Rook e4. That's an interesting one that we did not expect. So she's looking at just playing uh, rook to e1 and putting pressure on e5. Seems like that would be the idea with this move, right? Just the yeah. nice and simple. So what do we do against Definitely. this? Definitely. Uh, hmm. What do we do against a simple idea? Like, how are we? Are, are you going to. Jovi, earlier you mentioned the uh, Goldilocks rank for the queen being uh, d6, the sixth rank or the third rank. So uh, pr protecting that pawn another time with queen d6 looks natural. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, dive in and explore further. So queen d6, okay, and well, simple is as simple does. I love that film, by the way. Oh, I haven't seen it. For, you've never seen Forrest Gump? Oh, I have, I have, sorry. I didn't get, I, 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 it's been a while. Oh no, I gotta rewatch it. Let's, so, all right, one, two, three, got it right away. Um, so, rook e1, now, um, you can still play for this g6, bishop, g7, f5 idea, and I'm, I'm just a little concerned that that rook on e4 is gonna get kind of pushed back and black's gonna expand the position. So, um, for instance, after rook e1, if we play rook e, rook e8 or, uh, g6 right away. What's the follow-up idea here for white? Let's see. So should we, play, should we start with rook e8 or? Yeah. Okay. Let's start with something. Um, I, I'm not quite sure. Rook e8, rook e8 looks kind of a bit weird, but then again, it is defensive. Uh, I also quite like your idea of, okay, queen d6 on the board. So we could very well see this happen. And then this is the question. Well, of course, e5 is nicely overprotected d4 isn't necessarily gonna hit us right too hard because this rook again stands very well protected by the bishop by the queen and the knight so yeah do we go rook to a e8 or do we just calmly go g6 <laughs> no, I think no. about well, rookie one happens, so we're going to find this out. And I predict Ju and Jun's going to think a little bit here. Uh, because G6, my concern is that if you play bishop G7, then D4 might come into the play. Because if mm -hmm. pawn D4, there's bishop takes D5. So maybe we should put some some moves on the board but, just to kind of show that. Yeah, okay, so, so G, G6 and then, okay, so I go C6. I, I don't know, I'm just picking yeah. up some squares. And then you go bishop G7 and then, okay, D4 
will happen because of this pressure. And if you go pawn takes pawn, well, that would be a huge mistake, because not because of rook takes rook, but because of bishop takes knight. And yeah. then, oops, you can't capture back the bishop because of rook takes rook. And if you were to go rook takes rook, it would be the bishop that recaptures. And oops, you're down a piece. Absolutely. I like to call that the switch back. So the bishop on d5 removes itself from capture by switching back to taking the enemy piece. And now we end up up, up a piece and completely winning. So g6, it's like uh, if it doesn't actually threaten bishop g7, I wonder if like kind of what's what's the point, right? Hmm. But it's a nice safety move anyhow, but say for instance, I wasn't sure about c3, maybe we might see a move like h4 on the board, who knows? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they have this rule these days that when you don't know what to do, <laughs> just go h4. Uh, actually, yeah, quite I love move. it. I mean, hey, I think it, it applies well here. Yeah, it applies very well. Makes, makes, makes some space for the king. And uh, okay, well, I guess black will prepare. Or maybe you might go h5 themselves, I, I don't know. And uh, I like Inspector Gadget, great cartoon series. L Lei probably has prepared something slightly different. Well, we'll see what her idea is with rook e4. To me, it's, it's Jen's suggestion of just doubling on the e-line, putting the pressure on and maybe doing h4 because we've seen Lei is a very direct player. She plays for the most committal moves and at times she does let go to that feeling of just let's attack. So we saw that in uh, game seven where she faced the Karakana and she said, you know, this is the only chance I'm going to play G2, G4, maybe even in the whole championship match. So let's just go. Let's do it. Oh, and, and yeah, Ricky, so Ricky A was played because why not just play yeah, that first? Yeah. And now, because now with H4, I mean, you could still play H4 as white, but it's not quite as juicy when there's no pawn on G6 yet. Uh, but it could, it could still be a great move nonetheless. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm tempted to play it just because these days this is the move to consider because it's not necessarily the idea of going h4, g4, g5, blah, 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 let's go. The idea might be something positional. You just go h4, g3, stick the king on g2 and just, I call it creep up the board. It's very Karpov, Pavian, you know, you just creep up and maybe this rook will come to h1 and maybe one day you can slowly advance on the king side. Just keep that flexibility, keep your opponent guessing. I love, love. moves like that. When I when I do them, I feel very smart. And when oh, they yeah. work, when I when they don't work, you can just like, <clears throat> that, that didn't work. Next game. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it does feel good. It feels good, those Karpovian moves. Completely agree. A move like a um, rook e2 with the idea of queen e1, um, not really going to do that much here. Not quite enough pressure, I don't think, but still worth looking at. I think the problem is our, our minor, our major pieces are a little bit clumped up, um, and you probably have like an opportune moment to play knight f4, right? Yeah. But, but still, I think the idea is very much in the works because you can do everything, right? This is the type of position where you can go g3 first just to stop your knight f4 idea. Ah, uh, oh, look at that. There it, it is. is. played. <laughs> Brings a smile to all of our faces. It's that extra cup of coffee, that extra shot of espresso. <laughs> Out h4, love to see it. I also love it as well. And again, asking questions to Ju Wen Jun. And it's the kind of move that makes your opponent uncomfortable. So, We've got people screaming out in the chat, Simon, Harry, Tall. Hey, <laughs> nice. Judith. <laughs> yeah, Judith, Judith's trademark is G2, G4. She can have, she's that one. And... Uh, yeah, it was kind of interesting, actually, how chess has evolved through the ages, because I, I remember Simon many, many moons ago was going H2, H4, and everyone was kind of going, yeah, okay, Simon, 
that's a little bit too much. And now everyone is do it. And yeah, we have H2, H4 on the board. And remember the idea might not necessarily be to pawn storm the king side just yet, but it's just to creep up the board, maybe with G3, maybe with King G2, and maybe also in conjunction with the idea that Jan mentioned, which is just to line up all three pieces on the E line, put the rook on E2, queen in E1, pressure on the E5 point. Yeah, absolutely. Again, um, uh, by the way, we, we got a comment from chat. What about from Chadok who says, what about G4 YOLO? Um, and, and it's actually, a, it is a good question because I mean, shockingly, <laughs> Jade Hack is, is a good friend of mine. But uh, after G4, you are threatening G5, simply winning a piece. So, Jovi, is this a case of a moment of pleasure with a big threat for a lifetime of weaknesses? Well, this is actually something that I wanted to ask you about, you know, because mm -hmm. yeah, G4, G4, I wouldn't necessarily recommend just because, you know, you can't undo those pawn moves. And I love pushing pawns because I would be very hesitant about giving up the F4 square. Um, but on the other hand, I wanted to ask you about risk taking, because now we're coming to game 11. And if you make a mistake, that could be it. You could just completely lose the match just based on that one error. So how much risk should one take to that's push for that That's a great question. That is a, that's a wonderful question. And I do think it, it ties in to how you think your chances are in the playoff. And I believe both players are confident in the playoff. So that, that will tie into a little bit less risk taking, which I think you saw in the opening choice today. Um, that said, once the game is played, um, the players are looking for the best moves and most combative moves, so they're not agreeing to a short draw here. Uh, but I, I do think that uh, both players um, are are keen on that playoff. They're they're mm -hmm. okay with that outcome, and that will affect some of the risks that they take in these last two games. Yeah, and and how how do you also kind of assess the risk for your opponent as well? Because I guess that's also something that when you're playing poker, you're not just thinking about your own chances, you're thinking about your opponent as well, their chances, you're working out the, the probabilities and, oh, it's complicated. It is that psychology of trying to put yourself in your opponent's shoes. And the hardest part of that is like sometimes when I'm thinking about life or chess or poker, when, when I put myself in my, in my opponent's shoes, I'm still thinking about the situation as if it was me in their shoes, but that's not what it is. It's what you need to be thinking about is if it's them in their shoes. And that is of course far harder. Um, by the way, we do see H5 on the board. Um, now, the one thing I noticed about this move right away is that it makes the possibility of sticking a knight on G5 more compelling. Because one thing is that there's no H6s just to, to kick me out. And secondly, um, the idea that you were combating me with before was like G6, Bishop G7 and F5, not as compelling as well, now that you also have to move H5 in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Like you mentioned, the G5 square, you've conceded it and you, you gotta care about those squares. I still haven't managed to figure out the rhyme. If anyone is really good <laughs> at rhyming, <laughs> I won't care, I'm square. And I want to make a sentence out of that. <laughs> All right, chat, you've got a challenge. <laughs> you've got to care about the square. I don't, I, that, that's, that's all I've come up with so far. But yeah, I completely agree with you there. H5, you know, definitely to stop any kingside expansion, but it comes at a cost. And there's a big one of, of allowing white that square on G4. And yeah, it, it's definitely Ju Wanjun being careful. But I, I agree with you, you know, I, the first thing that comes to mind is like G3, don't pull out your hair, just care about the square. Yeah. <laughs> All right, who, who said that? Yeah. That's, a, that's one from H34L5. Like I, I'm thinking at the back of my mind, one of these days I will write something or, or do a course on, on these rules. And then at the end, I have these little rules in life and, and in chess. And at the end of it, I will say, now you know them, go break them. 
Well, you know, I, I have to say, Jovi, you do have the greatest range of writing in, uh, I think, uh, chess history. You've got a book on the Scandinavian and you've got a chess erotica novel. So you basically have a chess erotica novel and then the opposite of chess erotica, the Scandinavian. <laughs> so your range is just quite, quite, quite impressive. <laughs> but, but both books fantastic. I just, uh, yeah, I, thank I, you. The thank game. you. But talking about books, you have some <laughs> really good books. Uh, and actually, I have, I, I don't have the first one, Chess Bitch, but I, I the first one, I, when my niece started playing chess, the first book I got her was Play Like a Girl because I think that's such an important topic in chess. And it's so important that girls see other women playing chess and, and seeing some great moves that everyone has played. Uh, little Yovi, the next best rapper in the game. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think the rapper goes to Kanti, GM Kanti. He's he the best <laughs> when it comes to things. And whenever he does these expressions, I'm making note. Like we off to the races. I love that. And switch back. I, I'm borrowing that one as well. And you, you're taking all the credit for that. And the roving rook. Whenever, whenever you were the big inventor of the roving rook, Jennifer. Oh yeah, the rover, the rover, rook the up rover. And over. It's like the a, rook uh, and over. It, it's a little bit of a combined word there. But yeah, play like a girl. And I actually um, just wrote a book called Play Like a Champion, which is going to be out later this year. I think the idea that uh, we can learn as much from women's games, we can be as inspired from women's games as from you know games from anyone. And I know that when I was a little girl looking at chess books, there were so many books that didn't have a single game by a woman and. It matters, and I think that it's starting to change. There's a great Twitter account um, on the Queen side that is always highlighting all the great women's chess tactics that are happening every day. Um, so we've got the Women's World Championship going on right now, but it seems like every time you turn your head, there's you know Alice Lee playing in some major event and crushing grandmasters. There's so many. Um, women's tournaments and series. There's a lot of women's chess action here on chess.com, both in like the pro chess league, the speed chess champs. So we can really teach um, students basics of the game from games from women, from games from men. Uh, and it's nice to see that change, that more people are respecting the games of women. Um, and in fact, Jovi, there's a big story that's come out in the last few weeks that Norway Chess is going to create the first tournament ever where there's going to be an open event and a women's event, and the women's event is going to have the same prize fund as the open, and it's quite a generous one indeed. And uh, it's what, 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 super we're... generous. I love this idea. I really do, and I, I think it's time that we kind of stop with the constraints of the rating i think if you abandon that idea and you're just like okay let's just have a tournament the open and the women and have the same prize fund and give the opportunity for girls to see other women in action and also by having such a big prize fund it means that you it is more viable for a woman to make this a career because at the minute when you have much lower price funds for women, it's really not possible for women to actually earn money from playing chess because you have a situation where they're teaching on the side. And I know so many women who, top women who are teaching on the side. And I, I also learned that uh, a lot of the top women players are not getting their training camps paid for. In fact, it, they all have to pay for their trainers out of their own pocket. I certainly did. I didn't get any support and if you, you know, if you want the women to get better and there isn't enough women playing chess to have a community, then it is a problem. It is a problem because it, it kind of, it's a vicious cycle. You're not going to get the rating, um, the same ratings if you're not being able to dedicate the game in the same way. And we do see G3 being played. And just one thing I really wanted to mention is that we really do need to increase the numbers because one of the things, one of the big differences I see between men and women is that the men, because they're able to hang out with their friends, they're playing blitz all the time. They're playing online with their friends. They're playing over the board with their friends. With the girls, I mean, I, I have a, a memory of you and me playing blitz at the World Juniors, and that was great. We were playing against each other and we were playing as friends. And that was super helpful for my confidence and it was super helpful for all of us and that's what I want to see. 
I want to see that the participant participation rates increase so much that women can just hang out, play chess and just learn by playing. And I think this is where men have the advantage. And I do. Price I, I, uh, yeah. And sorry, I wanted to let you finish your point. Yeah, no, I just want to say, and if, if it's increased prize money and it's increased prize visibility, I think this is only a good thing. And I know there's a lot of naysayers, but let's face it, it's just one tournament. I, I, I don't understand. I really don't understand the objection to this. Oh, yeah, I love to see women get money. I mean, that's, uh, that's one of my uh, philosophies in life. Good people. Um, who are working hard and, and getting money. It's a, it's a brutal world out there. So I like to see um, them stack it up, that's for sure. And yeah, actually it's really interesting that you mentioned the blitz and the rapid thing, because I, I believe that that's true as well, that one thing that makes it a little bit more difficult for women is that social aspect. And um, I remember those games from the World Junior in Armenia. I, I do remember the Scandi. The, executing the Scandinavian against me. Um, but there's a study actually by a, a woman. Her first name is Miriam. Her, her second name I, I, escapes me right now, but I can find Bilal, it later. Is it Bilal? But, um, well, she's a, she's a PhD who does a mm -hmm. lot of studies, psychology studies on like um, gender and chess. And I, okay. I think one of, one of them showed that women um, are comparatively weaker at rapid and blitz as they are. So another way of saying is that is that they're good at classical. So that's one thing I always like to do. I like to flip things. So it's like you say that women are um, weak at rapid. What does it really mean? It means well that they're better at classical, right? Yeah. So, but but why is that? And, and what you mentioned, these kind of like these parties where people play blitz all night, um, women are sometimes left out of that kind of sphere, that kind of um, world and uh, hey, I guess we need more blitz parties for women. <laughs> that, that's I, I the think conclusion, so. Jeremy. I mean, totally. I mean, <laughs> really, it is. I mean, one of the reasons I became so strong is because my uh, and you you probably have the same experience. You were playing blitz against your brother, and I, he was doing that on a regular basis. Every night he would go, you know, come on, let's play blitz, and we we would play for hours. And I was learning on the fly and he would mock me relentlessly and I'd be like, oh, I'm going to get you. And then, you know, it really, it really helped me. And, and for a while, you know, I, I actually got to quite high levels in Blitz, but that was only on the back of this training. And I kind of want to see it for everyone. And in the meantime, we've had like, you know, I, actually, I should let you kind of chip in on this point. Oh yeah, Blitz, absolutely. Well, Classical was always more of my forte, but I, it was indeed those battles that I would play with friends at chess camps and whatnot that increased my, my Blitz level. And I think that's really important when you're coming up because it gives you confidence. If you can win mm -hmm. against higher rated players in Blitz, you know that they miss stuff in, in Classical as well. And uh, by the way, the name of that uh, professor is Miriam Dilma Dilmagani. So mm -hmm. you could look her up. She's got a ton of studies about like chess, gender, psychology, so really interesting stuff. Now, oh, what's going on here in the position? Um, I feel like I've got, it's like the five major pieces on the e-file. We do see that there's a tripling, but it wasn't rook, rook, queen, it's rook, queen, rook, right? Now, is d4 on the menu here? Is there any kind of threat of d4 coming? Or is it just, not not yet no. but it's definitely something that black has to consider so so d4 this this rook is just uh overprotected by this bishop but i wonder whether other ideas are are at play so for instance you know the, the piece that you've been obsessed about <laughs> I just wonder whether you could reroute it to d2 and then c4 and then still mm. increase the pressure and then the queen can come to f3. Whether we're going to see small moves like king g2. At the minute, this is just a big standoff on e5. I don't see yeah. the immediate. But there's still that point that remains that black kind of wanted to stick the bishop on g7 to give themselves a little bit of more um, yeah. possibilities of playing like f5 or knight f6. But there's always that worry that once you put the bishop on g7, d4 becomes an issue, right? 
because then all of a sudden you are underprotected on E7. Mm-hmm. So uh, definitely, like, I feel like white got a little bit more out of this than I would have expected, Jovi. Like, this is more pleasant for white, I'd say. This is more pleasant for white, but you're you're right, though. I mean, it's not, it's not easy. So say, for instance, you were to go, I'm not sure about bishop g7, because bishop g7, I always feel that maybe a d4 is going to come at you faster mm-hmm. than you know because of this uh, weak defender on d5 and all the tactics there so i'm just wondering if if you wait i don't know how to wait i'll be honest with you i'm not Mm. quite sure what white is planning so say i don't know go king g7 just just for something and what is white doing is knight d2 is is knight d2 the idea and yeah i like that i I like that too but then i was thinking actually what what is white's plan (laughs) Well, that, that's uh, a, a, I mean, that's the thing about bishops question. of opposite color, because uh, the pawn on e5 is, you know, presumably some kind of weakness. But the thing is, it's difficult to defend, to attack it enough times because um, you're the only one with a dark squared bishop, right? Mm-hmm. Or Juwen Jun um, is the only one with a dark squared bishop. So it's like we can attack it four times, but it's very easily defended four times as well. And we can't really attack it five times. No. No, we can't. We we can't kind of pile on the pressure. I'm not seeing a, a role for this bishop on b3 either. And okay, so king g7 wasn't played by Ju Wanjun, but I do see that she played the move a6. Do you know, this pawn structure always reminds me, and I've said it time and time again, of my of my father. So my fa- my father, you know, he, he was the big impetus behind my chess career. He decided from a young age that, you know, his children would play chess. And initially it was just going to be my brother. But then he found out that I was pretty good as well. So we, we he and he would always choose the most unfortunate times to study chess. Like we, he'd suddenly be like Christmas Day. Right. Let's study chess. And so he would gather me and my brother <laughs> and we'd be forced to to learn chess and I was like I could I could have really killed him because I wanted to watch TV, I wanted to watch the movies, but okay, I was doing chess. And um, but during one of these sessions, probably during Easter, I remember him reading some book from Botvinnik and I remember him talking about these pawns and for some reason it's always stuck with me. And he goes, This, according to Botvinnik, is the weakest like a structure of pawns because if this pawn comes to a5 they can't move <laughs> they're easily restrained and since then i just remember the triangle because <laughs> he called it the triangle it's a triangle it's so bad and yeah okay so this is a long-term point and you can just imagine in an end game if the white king were to come into b6 you know you'd totally understand his thinking and yeah but uh ju wanjin Obviously, she won't keep the pawns on a6, b7, and c6 for long. She has a plan. Is she perhaps planning to play b5 and see some space that way? Yeah, b5. Um, I like the way that it stops me from that idea of knight c4. So that mm-hmm. definitely has a benefit. And um, yeah, I guess that, that pawn triangle, maybe that contributed to you loving uh, these openings where you get a all the light square control, like the Scandi and the Carol Khan. I, I, I feel like when I was a kid, I must have been more more interested in the dark squares, which is why I like the Sicilian and the, uh, the dragon. But uh, yeah, you got, the, uh, you got the light square bug there with the Caro, which you also yeah. wrote a book on, right? I and- did, yeah. The, yeah, I know totally. I've been playing the light square strategy for a long time. I remember it was I, my brother laughed at me nonstop. And then when when one of my the English women's captains, he also laughed at me. He's like, you and your light square strategy. And I'm like, yeah, I know. What can I do? It works so well. Put your pawns on C6, D5 and get the light square bishop out. You're sorted. And OK, I'm being simplistic, but you get my gist. Sometimes you find your calling on the board and that opening is mine. Yeah, that's like an opening or a matter of chase. By the way, somebody really wants to see Anne Passant. <laughs> and luckily we can, I think we can honor the request here because 
if A5 happens as white, B5, um, no, B5, not a good move. I don't, I don't think so, but uh, it does allow for us to see this on passant move. Um, pawn takes B6, so there you got it. There you got it, high fantasy has been looking for that. Yeah, that was the um, passant, the special pawn move. I've uh, never really understood the point of it, but uh, okay, it is in existence and definitely you should be aware of this special pawn move. And also castling, when you think about it, doesn't really make that much sense. Well, you, we like, could get rid of K. We could get rid of castling, but if we get rid of out of on Pisana, there'd be too many draws. Because I think, you know, as soon as somebody puts some pressure on you with the pawns, you could just bypass it and lock up the position. Less liquidity is going to be more draws, I think. So mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you castling, but we got to keep on Pisana. Even though it doesn't happen that often, it's kind of like embedded in every position. Right? It, yeah. it, it disallows certain lockups. It's, it's interesting actually how chess has evolved throughout the ages and how there were like some rule changes, some pieces changed their roles. Like I think before queens could only move one square and uh, right. suddenly she became more powerful. And it would be, I, I wonder in the future what will be the next. Maybe they'll expand the board. <laughs> Maybe once yeah. it's been solved, right? Say for instance, they might go, okay, right. <laughs> Eight by eight has been solved, so maybe we're going to make it nine by nine and add a new piece or something. Well, well, we did have a Capablanca chess, which I think is is a, a bigger board. But uh, also there's the possibility of Fisher Random. There's some of the little tweaks that Alpha Zero uh, tried in cooperation with uh, Vladimir Kramnik. So, yeah, you mentioned it earlier. No castling chess could be a possibility. But for now, it does seem that there's still a lot of juice in uh, classical chess using the iconic position. And uh, especially when you have extra pressure like these two women do, because you know that you can't just draw infinitely. At some point, the time control is going to get faster and somebody's going to go down and somebody's going to be crowned women's world champion. Totally. And one thing about these two women, we have seen that they are tough competitors. Both of them have suffered a loss and both of them have managed to stay stable, just make things stable and just bounce back from this. Because, I mean, just take the World Championship match between Magnus Carlsen and Jana Pomneshi. After game six, that was it. Nepomneshi was just a completely different person and he was completely broken and that hasn't happened here at all. And then of course we had this year's World Championship match where it was backwards and forwards. That was so many, so much emotion there and A6 on the board. And I agree with you. I think we are looking at a very tense, very cagey position maybe the players are thinking about the long game maybe they're already thinking about what to do well, the teams certainly are at least if they get to a tie break and in oh the meantime, yeah 20 moves oh. played so a6 a6 on the board and um i mentioned this move a5 which is by the way probably a bad one because it weakens the not because of b5, which is a bad move allowing for en passant, but the move a5, we, we were considering it earlier, but now I wouldn't be as excited about playing it necessarily because I'm a little worried about that pawn on a5 becoming a weakness rather than a strength. Um, yeah. What do you think, Joby? Do you think that that's on the menu? I don't think a5 is on the menu because it doesn't have any backup and I would also be incredibly hesitant make, about making this move because I mean just visually you take a look and you say my bishop is on the light squares their strength is the dark square bishop that one can come back and pounce on this pawn so I, I would again I would be very cautious against advocating a pawn on a5 maybe if the bishops are off the board maybe if they're just knights and the queens are also off the board you can see a situation where a5 oh, did I just see it being played is that my oh. mistake um I know I think you are right I think it was played <laughs> the commentator's curse She'll never play A5. It's such a weird... Oh, man. I, I keep falling into this. 
<laughs> I mean, it's like I'm goaded into it and I can't help myself. No, it will never happen. No, she will 100%. <laughs> and I can see, boom, let's go, let, well, 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 okay, she's playing A5, I was like, it's not going to happen, I would be very hesitant, <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm, 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 I'm. <laughs> I don't learn my lesson, like a fool, what can I say, and okay, now that I'm a bit more, <laughs> more objective, it's all right, it's I can all right, see, because... I, I can see it is risky, it is risky because, of course, it's on the same color complex as the bishop, but she has a concrete idea in mind. She wants to move the knight to d2 and c4 and support the pawn on a5. But, wow. What now, by move? the way, um, one of the things that's interesting about this idea of knight d2 to c4, as you point out, that would protect the a5 pawn and also kind of like just really cement the strong knight, which I've been struggling with all game. But... There is a, th a negative of playing knight d2 to c4. Remember that you were always unable to play bishop g7 and f5 because I had d4. But I mm -hmm. feel like if I move my knight away um, now, uh, I'm not sure that whole idea will work because e5 is just like so well protected. And I, 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 I wonder if that might be part of this as well. So let's try... So still bishop g7, you have d4 right now. But let's say black plays, for instance, queen c7 to keep an eye on that pawn on a5. Now, what happens here? Can we get away with playing knight d2 and then if queen a5, knight c4? Knight, knight d2? Uh, I, okay, the, immediately the pawn grabber in me is like, okay, let's take it. Yeah, and, I, and now if knight c4, queen c7 and... Uh, Everything is protected, right? And d4, yeah. not a thing. You can just take it, right? Mm -hmm. hmm. so, so you have to defend. You do have to, after knights, after queen c7, I feel like you have to defend this. You which is, so, which you don't want to be going rook a1 because the rook is, has a role on e1, it doesn't have a role on a1. So I suspect that you might see move like queen d2. Right. Queen d2. We did ha we had our queen there earlier, but and there's no there's no C4 shame is in an idea. No shame in going backwards, right? It's hard to put any extra pressure on that pawn, right? Like if you could put your bishop on d8. Oh, by the way, it's funny you mention it. Like actually uh, the rules used to be that you could do that with the bishop, I think. Bishop really? to d8 like with the rook. Yeah, you could skip, I think. I think you could jump with the bishop. Um, I, I could be wrong about that, but I do know that the bishop rule, um, the bishop used to be weaker, um, and it could often, it couldn't go one square diagonally. It could go like two squares diagonally. So, mm. um, yeah, that, and I believe it might have been able to jump at some point. But yeah, if you could play bishop d8 here, then you could add pressure to that pawn, but um, you can't, and therefore it just seems that uh, it's a one-move pony, right? Queen to c7. Yeah, it, it, yeah, maybe, but still, at the same time, you're stopping this knight coming to d2. True. But, c but c4, but c4 is a problem because suddenly the knight might be an octo knight in the center, but all the squares have been taken away. And okay, we haven't seen queen c7, but instead we've seen queen to d7. All right, queen to d7 played. Huh. So what's the idea of that move? What do you think the idea of that move is? So we had our queen on that d6 square. Is it just anticipating that you might be trying to play knight d2 to c4? So we're just getting our, our queen out of capture in advance? Yeah, that, that could be the idea. Um, what else is that? I was thinking as well, just because I'm a brute at times, and I was thinking put the knight on f4. Get some checks in. Oh, uh, yeah, that's a, that's, I like that. Yeah, and also the queen could be looking at coming into h3. Again, I had I had a very unfortunate experience at the hands of Fabiano Caruana where he went and put his queen, well, he had a queen, I was playing black, so he put his queen on h6 and I could have chased it away and I didn't. And afterwards everyone was like you had a great position but you should have chased away his queen and i was like okay well no i know now but 
that's like something that's burnt me a little bit. And Queen H3, because it's scary. Yeah, Queen H3 it looks scary to me for the queen to be sniffing around this, this king. She doesn't have any backup. That's so a problem, yeah. That is yeah. a problem. Yeah, she's what all else? by herself. All by herself. Oh, another rule thing. I'm, I'm obsessed with chess rules. But um, you know that the, when they were playing around with the rules of the queen, you mentioned it could only move one square at a time in early versions of chess. And then it became the most powerful piece. There were also versions where it was able to move like a knight. And ah. you know, I think this was popular in Russia for some time. And now in chess variants, we call it an Amazon. A, a queen that moves like a queen and a knight. And if we had an Amazon in this position, queen h3 would be checkmate. <laughs> oh, that oh be, dear. Uh, that is nice. I, I never knew that the queen also could move like a knight in some versions. Hang on, uh, why was this not adopted by the mainstream? I mean, just imagine that. Instead of having yeah. a queen. But then, then again, would she only have the queen the, but then she would have the power of everything right she would be the queen bishop queen yeah bishop, exactly and a rook and a knight yeah it, it would be um a very powerful piece it, it would probably just put such a premium on king safety i mean uh, similarly uh, a queen on h6 would be checkmate right so mm -hmm. you, you these moves g6 and g3 would probably be off off balance so okay guys don't worry queen h3 is not a mate threat <laughs> but it is it is fun to just think about these different ways of chess being played and how we've kind of managed to find the one that seems to have tantalized um, generations and honestly um, tantalized even more people ever um, right now as, you know, we used to speak a few years ago about a chess boom, but now we just see it as chess. It's, it's not even exactly a boom. It's just chess is really popular and it's kind of staying that way, Jovi. I, yeah. It's so cool to see. It is definitely cool to see. You know, whenever I t tell people that I'm a chess player, well, they all kind of all say to me, oh, they, they've seen Hikaru on stream or they, they followed some something. Sometimes I get spotted on the street and they're, they're like, oh, chess. And they don't, don't often know my name, but sometimes they're like, oh, chess player, chess player. Chess grandmaster, I'm like not quite a grandmaster, but and we see knight d2 from Lady J. Knight and I was has wondering, been okay, she yeah, I was wondering what would happen if she did just completely ignore Ju Wenjun's idea and just move the knight to d2 and say I'm going to put the knight on c4 and uh, wait and whoops, I don't know what that knight that arrow was doing there, but c4. And then just see what happens next. I wondered what whether Ju was going to put the queen on h3, as chat indicated. Scary. Uh, it, does she have any other ideas? There's no pressure. There's no pressure on e5. Something that we've been we've been like quite adamant about. We're like, oh, you know, you can't go bishop g7. Cons consequences. This was a rule by a. You know, remember the Russian grandmaster Nadezhda Kosinsova. I was watching one of oh, her yeah. DVDs and it was really excellent and she was talking about how to improve your intuition and your instincts and for her it was all about consequences and she said the first move that you need to consider is um, the consequence of your opponent's move and so the first move is what move can you now make that you couldn't before because of your opponent's last move and you know we could never play after queen d7 in this position we can never go bishop g7 right because of this whole d4 plan and now knight d2 and it's happened on the board ju and jun knows about the law of consequences bishop g7 big threat of f5 yeah, a big threat of f5 now, and that is scary because the rook on e4 is all clumped up, right? We we don't even have the e3 square to backtrack to. Um, yeah. C4 looks like an odd position for the rook, so I wonder if she's going to have to feel compelled to move her her queen in this position, um, so that she opens up the e2 square to retreat the rook to. Like something yeah, like queen f3, maybe. Queen f3 looks okay. Queen f3 looks natural. And say I just do it anyway. Right, in for the sure. Penny, in for the pound. And yeah. King, Rick has to go back. Yeah, rookie too. Sure. 
And now you're not even getting to the G4, G5 square. I know, right? So I blocked my, my beautiful square on G5. Good point. But I felt like at least now my yeah. queen is putting pressure on the D5 square. I, this position is hard to evaluate. I mean, black obviously has activity, but they also have permanent weaknesses. So I, I guess this is, this is a really a battle of ideas and way more combative than we might have expected on like move eight or nine of this opening. I mean, this is a real treat because it could have been like a, all the minor pieces traded. Here we've got massive imbalances. It's about squares versus activity. White has the squares, black has the activity. Who's going to prevail? Yeah, I I don't know. I, I feel like objectively maybe white has gone wrong because it feels like one of those situations where white has gone backwards, black has gone forwards, taking space. And yet you highlighted G5 is big weakness, but as long as there's no pieces getting there, it's not a problem. And I'm still at a struggle. Like, what can white do? Like, even if you get your knight to c4, what is the follow up? And that is something I'm, I can't see. How about this? Okay, how about if instead of playing queen f3, we play like queen d1, so that when you play f5, we, we can try to get our knight to g5 more quickly. I mean, it looks really passive uh, for the queen, um, mm -hmm. but maybe it's worth it if we can get our sink our knight into g5. Yeah, I, I think she needed to think about that move, but we saw queen f3 on the board. Yeah, interesting, interesting. It's kind of one of those situations where white wants two pieces for f3 because our knight's best on f3, even though I've been complaining about it, all game. I'm like, that knight's terrible. But all of a sudden, you're you're playing h5 and f5. Suddenly, I want that knight on f3, okay? But I also want my queen on f3 because I um, need space for my rook to go backwards, and I want my queen to be active. So this is what happens when we have less space than our opponent. We have squares that we want for two different pieces, right? Sometimes three. Uh, and yeah. uh, that's the advantage of having more space. It certainly is, and you need to make some peace trades. And I really do think Ju Wanjun is going to make the move at five. And as Chad's indicating, Ju looking more confident. And having watched Ju play for a few games, I can certainly see when she has certain body, when she's fed up, she's just like leaning backwards. <laughs> and the, the, and then and then at some point she kind of leans backwards and then she kind of goes back and she gets focused again and here when she sits like this upright back straight then she is very keen on the position and i think f5 we might see something like that but it is very committal and f5 on the board the rook comes back to e2 Oh, and baby. I just wonder how Leighting J is going to untangle. That's right. She's got a big untangling news. task, doesn't she? Um, Jovi, you know, you've been uh, singing about F5 for quite a while. You mentioned earlier that you were hoping to see that at some point, this idea of F5. And here it is. Your dream, it came true. And we've got ourselves um, a heck of a position. Very imbalanced. Very... Um, aggressive for black, not just H5, yeah. but F5 also. Yeah, I agree. It is game on in game 11. And we just saw Ju Wenjun confidently take some space in the center. Leighting J, her pieces are awkwardly placed. So big dilemma for Leighting J. How will she untangle? And for Ju Wenjun, can she start pushing home a small advantage? Well, we're going to take a quick break and you're going to find out as we catch up on all the action in just a few minutes time. So don't go anywhere. Chess.com's game review recently got a major update. Here are four key notes. At the end of each game review, you will now see a summary of the game from your coach, your performance rating for that game, and a quick grade for you and your opponent in the opening, middle game, and end game. 
we've added a new classification called Miss for when a move fails to take advantage of an opportunity, but it is otherwise a sound move. We've also changed the definition of blunder. Now a move will only be considered a blunder if it loses material or allows a checkmate. Coach will now draw arrows and highlight squares when you hover over or click on the highlighted words in the move explanation. This should make move explanations easier to follow. Finally, Coach's explanations will now reference specific pieces and threats in explanations, making move explanations much more intuitive. The new game review experience is available on chess.com right now. What's the best way to follow any chess event from the Champions Chess Tour to the Candidates, Speed Chess Championship, Title Tuesday, FIDE World Championship, and so much more? Chess.com slash events has all of the top chess tournaments played both over the board and online. Analyze and review games from the world's greatest players with live commentary, cloud analysis, opening explorer, and table bases. Find all the key event information, including schedules, prizes, results, news reports, player bios, tie breaks, and more. Even compete by voting for your predicted results. Explore chess.com slash events today on web or with our iOS and Android apps and experience chess like never before. China, the world's oldest civilization was born here. Thousands of years later, it is one of the world's chess powerhouses. For most of the past 30 years, China has held the most prestigious title in women's chess. The legacy of the Women's World Championship is rich. Menchik, Gaprindashvili and Chibodonitsa, Kostenyuk, Zijun and Ho Yifan. Now three-time world champion Zhu Wenjun is defending her title once more. After vanquishing the likes of Katerina Lagno and Alexander Goryashkina, another rival awaits. Challenger Lei Tingzhe had to defeat three grandmasters in matches herself to get here. In the first two rounds of the candidates, she took on sisters Maria and Anna Muzichuk and won. Then in the final, she beat former world champion Tang Zhongyi. And that's it! Designation! Lei Tingzhi, the winner of the 2023 Honey Finals. Will Ju Wenjun defend, or will we have a first-time champion, Lei Tingzhi? 
Half the match is in Ju's hometown of Shanghai. Half the match in Chongqing, where Lei hails from. Who will win and claim their share of the 500,000 euro prize fund? Welcome to the official broadcast of the 2023 FIDE Women's Chess Championship. And we are back. And uh, if you woke up and you expected just a boring position on the board, whoa, you are very much mistaken. Because of these two players, Lei Tingjie and Ju Wanjun, nothing can separate the two. And they are fighting it out in a thrilling position once again. We see Ju Wenjun with the black pieces. She's taking the space. Lei Tingjie, she has less time on the clock. She also has some questions to answer, some plans to solve. My God, this is getting tense. I can feel the pressure that both these players are going through. And Jennifer, my goodness me, we are in for a treat. That's right. Earlier in the game, we thought that maybe this game would be kind of, I don't want to say boring because at this stage in the world championship, it's never boring, but we thought that it might be very balanced. Just a bunch of trades of knights on d5 and d4, but instead we have this extremely imbalanced. A lot of people think about bishops of opposite color and they think draw it. But guess what? In the middle game, sometimes bishops of opposite color can do the exact opposite. Wait a second. Opposite color bishops can do the opposite <laughs> and they can make the game work of that is as it allows us to really focus in on different weaknesses, right? As we kind of corral our entire army and you see that happening here. It's difficult now to trade off everything because these bishops are, are so different. And then of course the pawn structure is also incredibly imbalanced. Whites is you know, looking very solid. Black, on the other hand, is um, expanded with h5 and f5. Um, why not both, right? Be aggressive, yeah. be, be both. Uh, but is, is, it, is she gonna live to regret that if somehow her king becomes weak? It, it's all gonna be questions that are answered in like what, the next hour or two, Jovi, as this is a, a true battle of ideas. It is a true battle of ideas. You know, Ji Wan Jun, she's just playing on space. I mean, she's just grabbing everything she can. And, well, she doesn't care about the consequences. And there have been some consequences. For instance, you know, in an end game, say, you know, you all the pieces are removed except the opposite color bishops. And you can see this bishop would be able to dive into e, to e6, c8, munch, munch, munch. But, okay, so that's like a long-term thing that will haunt Ju Wen Jun. And uh, secondly, you mentioned it way before the end game, there's the middle game. And this king could also be a weakness. You can just imagine if this knight were to magically appear on g5, and if somehow or other you manage to open up this long diagonal for the bishop to start working their magic, then okay, black's position will be in tatters. But well, there are two people playing the game and uh, <laughs> there is a flip side to every coin. And you see Ju Wan Jun, she has control of all these squares and she's got just nice control in the center. And Lady Jay's pieces are just clustered together. They have no point. They have no purpose for the time being. So she has to make everything work. And for the time being, Ji Wen Jun's position is easier to play. I feel like she could almost go king h7 and just wait and see what uh, Lei Ting Jie has, will come up with. And there we see queen d8 played. Ah, queen d8. Okay, so just a few moves ago, this 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 queen moved to d from d6. So it's it's really trying. You mentioned d6 is the Goldilocks square, but it's it's trying all the different beds of the house, right? We've gone from d, <laughs> we've gone from d8 to d7 to d6. It feels very Scandinavian, like I must say. <laughs> but <laughs> well, but, you know, wasting time with the queen, I, I approve. But I mean, she's allowed to get away with such things because the position is still relatively close. There's still tension in the center, and there is no immediate breakthrough. I mean, what 
The first question though is what is the point to Queen D8? Is she planning to switch over and play oh. Rook D7 and line up against D3? Mm. And okay, Knight C Knight C4 played quickly Quick. by Lady J. And the King H ah. seven. And King H7, okay, because Knight C4 protected the pawn on A5, so that was the other mm -hmm. concrete point of oh, Queen yeah. D8, that it did attack that. But I, I really like the point you were making about that D3 pawn is now a bit of a weakness, but Rook D7, I, I don't think it's on the menu quite yet, because we do uh, have that pawn on E5 that we could capture if you were to play Rook D7. So what now? What now for Black? Bishop's, oh, by the way, Bishop C2 was quickly played. So a lot of quick moves are being played now. And uh, what do we think Black is trying for at this point? I, I don't know. Black's position is very pretty, but there's no plan of action just yeah. yet. Because, you know, you're tied. There's no pawn advancing happening on the queen side. Nothing. You don't touch this beautiful chain of pawns as well on the king side so maybe just wait i somehow i also don't really want to be putting my rook on d7 for the time being because there's too much pressure on e5 so that's going to lose a pawn so maybe you know what and uh is Ju just gonna go for the draw so is Ju simply gonna go king h8 King H7 and just say, say, oops, not King H6. That was me making some random move again. I clicked on the wrong square. And okay, so I was just thinking King H8. But it's probably okay. You probably play King H6 and then go back to H7 without a complete disaster, which, uh, which shows you quite how solid what Black's position is. But solid is not winning. Um, because as you mentioned, it's very hard to make progress. Like if we try to play Knight F6 and E4, e5 pawn hangs right that's a problem mm -hmm. and uh, I that's why Jew Jews played uh, queen c7 just overprotect e5 okay okay i like that all right so the, this gives us a little insight into how um, black might try to make something out of this so again if i could play the move knight f6 um maybe i'm cooking again right i i, I the knight on g4 could be a interesting square but also that idea of possibly playing e4 there's something to think about there at least got to give white something to think about yeah definitely yeah i, I like your idea of knight f6 knight to g is, is knight to f6 something so say you make a non-move i just want to just tactically is this still a possibility yeah it is oh. isn't it yeah, um, we we all, we have enough pieces protecting um, the. Yeah, E5. exactly. Yeah. So that is annoying, I think. So th that so is... black. Yeah, black retains some a little something here. Uh, so is there a what, what was the nothing move that you made by the way? Bishop B three. I made Bishop oh. B three. Uh, that was my nothing move. Um, what would be another move to to make? I, I'm I've now run out of moves. Well, I, 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 I don't, don't know. I really want to like... be playing. I, I can't move the knight from c4 because the a5 pawn is going to hang. Well, the question is, I, I, I don't think your move bishop b3 is very nothing because it, it is uh, probably better on b3 than c2 because the kind of the, the center of action seems to have moved. You you didn't try to double on and focus on that weakness on d3. So why not put your bishop on a better square? Um, but after bishop b3, the, I guess the one of the questions is, okay, if I do play knight f6, so we're not hanging anything on e5, but it, do I really have a good idea? Because the knight on g4 might not really be supported by any other of my pieces to do anything cool. And playing the move e4 could drastically backfire, right? That can end up being a terrible positional mode. Um, it's very, very concrete. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I think that's a question. Like, suppose I just like move the king king here, like king h2 or something. Is e4 actually a good move? Oh, king h2 is horrible, sorry. Um, well, uh, king h2 some... probably is, is okay, right? I mean, if, if you just, because just to go back to your point, you know, if you just make a nothing move, king g2, and then you put your knight on g4, and then I go, I don't know. <laughs> I waste time again with the bishop just to, just to stop. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, what next? Well, what about e4? Is is e4 just a really bad move? Like, after, instead of knight g4, what about trying okay, to move yes. up? Okay, yes. 
Well, the reason yeah, I, did, I, yeah. So if E4 here, um, but it's a, it's an aggressive move. But the problem is, what happens if uh, White just takes on E4? Um, if you take, are you taking? Uh, yeah, that that uh, is a big question. But I think that if you try to take with the pawn, that pawn on E4 is it a strength or a weakness, Jovi? Yeah, that is a big question and one I don't know. Because <laughs> I feel like if you take with the rook, then there's going to be a lot of trades and the position is working its way to being declared a drawn. But if you take with a pawn, if you really wanted to imbalance things and take with a pawn, I guess you have to move the queen and now you can do your knight jump. I don't know where. I mean, I feel like knight to d5 might be a, a better option. But... Yeah, you do feel like e3 is going to get pushed soon. Right. Um, but I feel like something like queen c5 maybe. I, I feel C5. like if I can if I can try if I can stick my queen on d6 and try to get that queen trade in, I think that it's going to be good for me because you're trying to kind of expose my king and get uh, activity against my king. So I, I feel like I'm hanging on here for white. It's it's not like you're playing e4 and you're knocking me out. You're giving me some problems, right. but you're chasing me around, but you're not knocking me out. And again, it all, when come back to this situation, it all depends on risk. How much risk do you want to take? How, you know, how complicated do you want the position to be where the margin of error is quite high and also quite, has it carries a lot of consequences. And we see Leighton J, she decides to wait but she puts her queen on g2. Okay. I, I understand that move. It feels a bit weird, but I understand that, you know, there's, there's not a clear cut idea for white. Yeah. But yeah, how much, but, but going back to that, how much risk do you think Ju Wenjun wants to take in this position? How much should she push? Because we, you, you, like you saw e4, if she captures with the pawn, as you highlighted, she's setting herself up for, you know, scrovelling in an end game if it gets that far. Yeah, I think that both players are very confident. And, you know, that's such an important skill of a chess player. And on one hand, you would say, well, I, oh, hey, if they're confident, then they should try to win at all costs. But what it also says is that they're not afraid of a playoff. And in fact, the confident player often wants to take it to the tie break because they get to play more games. So if you are confident about your skills and your openings, then you want to play those four games that you get to play if you have um, you know, an even score in these classical games. So we yeah. saw that very clearly in the World Chess Championship match between Fabiano Carana and Magnus Carlsen, that Magnus um, actually took a draw in a better position because he was so keen to get to the playoff where he had so many games and he thought that he could win, right? And so I, I, I think that is a really interesting aspect of this. And, you know, for everybody listening and watching, um, confidence in chess. I mean, this is the championship combination, right? Chess skills and confidence. And the reason that these two women are here is because they have both of those in spades. Yeah. And I once heard a saying, and it made me laugh quite a bit, is the higher the ego, the higher the elo, because it's elo rating. <laughs> 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 and after Queen G2, we did see the move Knight F6. I also saw a question in chat uh, asking about the move F4. Now, the move F4 is quite committal in general because it just concedes the E4 square and suddenly the rook can go back and also you open up the line for this light squared bishop. Does white want to be playing F4? Maybe, maybe, but they're definitely, it will have to wait until this rook on E7 or E8 is loose and can't be attacked. But again, these are very risky moves because they're opening up the position. And of course, if you open up the position, then basically it becomes incredibly heart sharp and it will depend on who has initiative, who has the stronger bishop. And at the minute, if you open up the position, white might have the stronger bishop. So nine of six played. 
and uh, Jiwanjun maneuvering. I like this move. I like this plan that you suggested. And you know, if you get a knight to g4 and you provoke f6, that's a further weakening of the white king. Yeah, true. So this knight is potentially added to g4, but I don't know. The thing is, it just seems like it's chilling by itself on g4 without any real clear follow-up. Uh, but is e4 a thing? No, I don't think so, because the pawn ends up becoming a weakness there, especially because of Lei Ting Che's clever move, queen g2, so you don't get a tempo when you play e4, right? No tempo means that we have the time to corral the pawn, right? You, you, if you play for e4, we can, uh, and take it with the pawn, we can simply bolster our attack with knight d2, and you're going to regret e4. So, um, cagey and careful play here, I think, for both players. Very well-played game so far, I would say. Um, and you know when two players play really well, it often means that we see a draw. Is that going to happen in this game? I mean, we got to start looking at the time. I mean, we haven't spoken about it too much, but like that's the issue. Is there a way for um, Ju Wen Jun to make things exciting um, and put Lei Ting Che under pressure um, in the next uh, 10 or 12 moves? Well, that is the question. And it's, there is also a, the benefit of just simply making like random moves because the human psyche has a weakness that it wants to do something. And sometimes the best thing is to do absolutely nothing. And I swear, if there was a book saying the art of doing nothing, I would buy it. I think there probably is. It sounds like they should be. But oh, yeah. Oh, there's I actually like this. Uh, Jovi, there's, yeah? a great, is there a book? there's a great book. It's a phenomenal book. It's called How to Do Nothing. It's by an artist and author in San Francisco. Um, and it's really about resisting. It's the, the subtitle was Resisting the Attention Economy. And so it's all about mm -hmm. resisting the idea that you always have to be doing something productive. Yeah, like the idea that you can't just like go on a walk and like listen to the birds and the, it, 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 that you have to be like, uh, you know, using your pedometer, getting your steps in, listening to a podcast by like, you know, about being more productive, right? It's, it's a fantastic mm -hmm. book um, and, you know, you're, you're going to love it. Let me know what you think after you read it. There's no chess in it though. So. No, that's fine. That is fine. Um, I, I read a great book and it was all about uh, golf. It was how to train on golf and it was just about how to breathe through and how to meditate. I can't remember what it's called. I think it's like breathe golf. And yeah, it's it, how to do nothing. Uh, definitely how to do nothing. And you can see there that uh, Lei Ting Jay, she could not do nothing. She simply, she pushed a pawn forward and one of the great things about having been sat next to David Howe for a long time during the Champions Chess Tour is he's so reluctant to push pawns. <laughs> <laughs> and he, and, he, and I'm, I'm like, no, push that pawn. And he's like, whoa, steady on. <laughs> Once you make that decision, you, you can't take it back. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't care about the consequences. And But anyway, he's, he's made, you know, and also Sam Shankland as well. You know, both of them talk about, you know, you you got to be careful about pushing pawns because if you push pawns too far, they leave behind weak squares. And we've got a few moves. Weak squares, we do have a few moves. F3 played. The This knight on d5 was very much controlled on f6. So that's why Ji Wenjun moved it. And now the queen. There's some weaknesses around the king. And we see Ji Wenjun playing bishop f6 now. This is where the mind games begin because this could be very much a waiting move or or it could be <laughs> one fine day preparing G5 and a breakthrough on the king side. Oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> I, I already said why not both when F5 and H5, but why not all three? Oh boy, yeah, exactly. chocolate, vanilla and strawberry. Let's get them all here as we look towards that Neapolitan structure with the H5, G5, and F5. And I don't know if that's yeah. going to happen, but it, it I, does look like it's geared up. Exactly. This is the thing. This is what's going through Lei Ting Jay's mind. You know, is this just a waiting move, just, or is this like the beginning of Rook G7, G5, and switcheroo over to the king side? I, I, I don't know. 
It pro is it any good? Probably not. But it's the kind of thing that pro can provoke discomfort in your opponent and can just provoke them to do something not very good. Never underestimate the power of someone's <laughs> someone to go wrong. And we will see how Leighton J re reacts. And you know, you mentioned how this the players have played very accurately. Well, take a look at these stats. So I'm looking at the chess.com board and I can see that Leighton J has played with 98.7% accuracy. That's a big number if you ask me. And Ju Wenjun, she's on 99.1% accuracy. Wow. She said she's 99% honest and in this game, 99% <laughs> accurate. There we go. I, I think that the cool thing for Lei Ting Che is that like there's not much for her to do here because um, all of the moves that you can make with your pawns are just devastatingly weak, like G4, F4. I mean, we could go through them for the chat, but I mean, for the viewers, but it's they're all bad. D4, B4, every pawn move looks horrible. So I, I got to say I'm I'm with your 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 pal David here, Grandmaster Hal, because um, white White just needs to go bishop b3, bishop c2. I mean, I, I don't see how we can make a pawn break here for white because they all look devastatingly weak. And our major pieces are more or less where they want to be. So let's just keep moving the bishop back and forth. And you tell me what you want to do. Really, the onus here is on Ju Wan Jun because she's kind of got the nicer position. You show me um, how you're going to win this game or try to win it. Yeah, I I agree with that. I think somehow or other you've got to maintain the balance. But if again, this is the thing. If you're going through bishop b3, then as Ch Chats highlighted, it's like g5. Is that ever a problem? Is that something you should be worried about? Mm -hmm. And you could see like maybe some like moves could be made. Like king h2 feels like it's an accuracy just because it's putting um, the king on the same diagonal as the queen. Uh Again, it's it's very cagey stuff, and I completely agree with the comment that said um, either this position is going to be a repetition or it's just going to get insanely complicated. Yes, and I also agree. Somebody pointed out that it's Ju Wen Jun's choice. It's her choice mm -hmm. um, make it complicated or repetition. So. Um, she's happy to have that extra time because this, these are going to be some uh, some big decisions for Ju Wen Jun, our, our reigning women's world champion. Yeah. And uh, whilst she, as Lois Lei Tien Jie is thinking, shall we just kind of like take a deep dive and wonder what happens? If, if G5? If, yeah. If G5. So say you make a, like, Bishop B, I, I, I don't know, King H1, Bishop, Bishop B3, I, I honestly... I, uh, let's say bishop b3. Could you get away with playing g5? Because if you can't, then the answer is probably no, right? Because the queen will slide over to h2. So just pawn takes bishop. So pawn takes pawn, bishop takes pawn. And this was my move to uh, h2, what I was so thinking queen, about. So queen h2, and you're saying that uh, if, knight f, if knight f6, um, you just have some kind of... Um, F4 action somewhere like knight e5 and F4. Why, why is this? I think uh, this queen ah uh, just queen h3 and the weaknesses are are really showing. Ooh, yeah. yeah and, and if I play a queen d7, then my knight my pawn on e5 is exposed. So yeah, yeah. it's like all of those weaknesses um, make this a victory for white. So that's the thing, you know, you can overpress. Ju and Jun's position is great, but you can't get too wild or suddenly the tables turn. You're completely correct, you know. And we'll see. I, I think the best thing is for both sides to wait. So after some move like bishop b3, I wonder whether... <laughs> I don't know whether we might see weird moves like king h6. <laughs> uh, that you, would... know, you know, when I played grandma stirs... <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna. They they do this kind of stuff to me. Okay, King G2 played. King G2. Or, okay, fair enough. That was kind of one King of those G2? weighty moves that we predicted. By the way, somebody had is, asked. A, somebody had asked about F4 yeah. earlier, and I, I have to say, I feel like the question is 
more pertinent now than ever because the king's on g2. So if we play f4, um, yes, we terribly weakness our e4 square, but we are going after the f4 square. So this is definitely a question worth asking now. Yeah, definitely. And the first move that jumps to me is g4 because yeah, if you can't even think about allowing a knight to jump into f4 because, ooh, that is not going to sit well with the white king. So the first move that I'm thinking is just g4, lock that square down, and then, huh. and then takes. kind of go for, you had to takes, and, and I guess F3 you have to take, oh, F3, oh my the... goodness me, and f3. Oh. I'm looking for the sack, but I think you yeah, have to take f3. Nice. I, I do have king takes oh. f3 in, in G e4 check. Uh, it's wild. I, I mean, e4 check has got to be good, right? Oh, it's got to yeah. be fantastic, right? Oh, my goodness me. No, I, I, oh. you're sharp, Jennifer. <laughs> I, I didn't see this idea of just get, oh, goodness me. No, I, I you can't. This, this feels like it's all falling apart, right? Queen f4 check. Yeah, this looks uh, very promising for black. So what do you do? Do you have to sacrifice the exchange? Maybe you have to sacrifice the exchange earlier with like queen takes f3. Um, yeah, so it's g4. Okay, so I was just stopping there. I did not see this idea of f3, which you pointed out. So that's it's, um, that means I have to go queen takes. Yeah, and you then... got to sack, sack the exchange. But you know what? Sacking the exchange here could be very adequate. Because we because well let's see where do we put our king though we don't want to put it on the h two c seven diagonal because then we're going to get in um, in trouble um, when you take on e two you, you have, have a check a, where to, where to put it I was thinking h one but maybe king sure two. sure let's try h one okay so, so h one and now after knight takes e two oh I see you also have queen takes f six possibly in some line ha 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 so me. So maybe we put the king on h3, and then the knight, uh, I don't know. I don't know. There's a lot to look at here, Joby, but I, I think that this is a, a, this is a, a crazy, you, fascinating line. Whoa. Yeah, yeah you but, think? you know, this something like this could happen, and, and you feel like anything, and absolutely anything will happen. After rook f7, I'd, I'd, h5. Yeah, Although, hang eight, on a second... We need to look at what happens after bishop takes pawn. If you can get away with that, rook h2, g5 is the idea. Oh, d, d, <laughs> d4, d4 check. Yikes. It, it, it oh. is yikes, isn't it? e4 comes and blocks and ugh, oh, still boy. pinned. So you can still go knight e5. I, this is just chaos. <laughs> this is a fun part. Oh gosh, I hope that Ju Wen Jun plays F four <laughs> because that is that is that's going to be quite quite the uh, the shake up to the game. Now, is there another move besides your G four though? Let's see. Is there is there some way where we can avoid all these all these crazy complications after F four? Any other possibilities here? Whoa. I'm wondering about something like D four with the idea that if. Uh, no, I was thinking that after takes on g3, queen g3, I'm threatening queen g6, Jack. That was kind of my I idea, guess, but, knight, but yeah. what were you going to say? I guess knight, you've got knight f4 at the end, of, uh, protecting everything, and you still have, and I saw the evaluation bar just, so it says right. something amazing. And, okay, so, yeah, so you have this idea, and nope, that's not it, because the evaluation bar shoots up in white's favor. Huh. Okay. Wow. So that that must this... be because you can't take you can't take the rook. Yeah, like we just yeah. play king h two. You just king f one okay. or something. King f yeah, king h two. Yeah. So that okay. can be it. So let's let's be th thematic about this. Checks. Someone someone did say okay, they can't wait to get a position where it's like checks captures threats. And here is one of them, you know, checks. Uh, so we've done that capture. So now we need to do this capture. Yeah. There's no checks. Yeah. So let's do this capture. And yeah, maybe this is the one, actually, because then you you jump and yeah. you're jumping in. Yeah, this, this pawn is going. And 
Well, no f4, but queen to d8 played. But f4, that would have uh, taken a match to the position and set it on fire. But maybe it's still very much in the air. King to g f4 would have been a really good try to mix things up. And queen d8 played. And I wonder whether she's setting it up because huh. then you have this pressure against h4. Indeed, very good point. I mean, I, I do feel now that the king on g2 is misplaced when you look at those lines where f4 seems so much more promising because we can't take. Um, and g4 also uh, leads to some issues with the, the sacrifice. Uh, so yeah, the queen on d8, we, 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 we keep seeing this dance of the queen. This queen, if you track its movement, it's like doing a little waltz here from d6 to d7 to d8 to c7 to d8. But you know what? It's working out for Ju and June as she is the one putting pressure on white here. <laughs> it it's certainly is working out. And I'm just thinking, you know, hang on a second, is f4 like a, a big threat? So say you again make a nothing move. Now your idea of f4 is going to be really good because in all those lines, yeah, you know, maybe white was getting, okay, rook h1 played. I see, rook h1 prote oh, protecting that pawn so that uh, if f4 we can play g4, is that the idea? Let's try it. Whilst uh, we have the analysis board up and with the position being so complicated, Let's go for it. Can we go for it? F4? Yeah. Let's okay. give it a try. F4. F... And now if G4, because here's the thing, when you take on G4, maybe we can just play H5 straight away and allow G3 check. I don't know. That seems pretty crazy, right? Okay. The, the, the our rook is poised, whether we take on G4 right away or not. Now our rook is poised for the attack, as is our bishop on C2 waiting in the wings. Yeah. By the way, somebody pointed out that when I mentioned Ju Wen Jun's queen dance, it was more like a foxtrot than a waltz. Well, I haven't taken ballroom dancing myself, so I take your word for it. Okay. The foxtrot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, yeah, I, uh, I like that expression, foxtrot. And uh, I agree with you, but this position, this could get wild. Because what's to stop this happening? Because I guess... I right. Guess you, um, I guess you can't do your. You can't live like this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Something bad is going to be happening in the kingdom. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I'm Rurik F7. No, no, no. Before I had E4 check, but yeah, Rook F7, something to the F file looks uh, very promising indeed. Um, but uh, queen, we were going to do f3 check, queen takes f3, queen, right? queen takes f3, and then still sacking. knight f4 check. So we're, we're, we're planning on sacking the exchange here. Um, and let's, I, can we put our king? Hmm, now the qu big question is where to put our king? None of the squares seem that great. <laughs> and that's the problem. I guess, I guess g3? I, I, I suppose it depends whether we want to have the option of playing, um, Queen takes f6, but I don't think we can really ever do that because your knight comes back to the g4 square. So what do you think, Joey? Where do we put that king here? I, I don't know. King f1, king f2 looks a bit like, oh, I don't know what's happening no. there. But maybe, maybe maybe it might be okay. Maybe you can... I'm just wondering what could like Humor me. Oh, the knight takes... You go, let's get out of there. Ah! And then... <laughs> And then e4, just the cold-blooded pawn takes e4. Pawn takes four. Yeah, and then you, then you, then you, what you do is you park the knight in front of the king, and you say a knight is a king's best friend. I am. Come, you can't touch this piece. Um, okay. Yeah, that was me having fun, but the evaluation bar is like staying at that halfway point, so it doesn't hate it, and that's already good news in my opinion. But. Yeah, I mean, goodness me, to have such courage to play this. But even this position, it's so crazy. I, I don't know what's happening here. Uh, I guess maybe you trade of queens. And it just feels like 
white could win, black could win. And uh, Nod Evolution says, feels like a very sharp position. Yeah, absolutely. This is like buckle up, hold on to the edge of your seat stuff because the margin of error gets uh, very low now. If someone makes a mistake, this could be something that actually decides the world championship match. And mm, so it is true, it is true. Drew does not need to go in for these complications after Rook H1. She does not need to go F4, going back to the position. But it is tempting. She could improve the position, so I guess she could kind of go Rook G7 or something. Rook G8, Rook G7 I would prefer. Oh. And then go for F4. But... yeah. Well, how many moves in? 32 moves in, and this position could get wild. We could see hair-raising stuff in the Women's World Championship Game 11 if Ju decides to actually take the F-pawn and push it one square forward. Chaos could be initiated, and we will find out what is going to happen just after the break. But first of all, Something exciting is going to be happening later today. It is the 2023 Bullet Chess Champion Finals. Hikaru Nakamura has cemented his place in the final match. Now, Magnus Carlsen, our very own Daniel Naroditsky and Ali Reza Faruja might fight for the seat across from Hikaru, the reigning champ of the BCC. These final four players have displayed incredible and exciting bullet chests this past week, and it all comes to a head later today. Who will be the 2023 bullet chess champion? Use exclamation mark BCC in chat to learn more. And with that behind us, Black is the one pushing here. Buckle up, ladies and gentlemen, because we are going to continue our coverage of the Women's World Championship match right after this break. Struggling to improve your game? Chessable is the home for chess improvers. With hundreds of courses by incredible authors like world champion Magnus Carlsen, Christoph Selecki, Andras Toth, everyone's favorite social media troll known as Anish Giri, and so many more, Chessable can help you raise your game to the next level. You getting started on the fundamentals? You should check out everyone's first chess workbook. Maybe you want to stop letting all those points slip away in the endgame. 100 endgames you must know is the course for you. Did you not notice your king was in check and still can't figure out why the pieces won't move? Actually, uh, Chessable can't help you with that. Maybe try refreshing your tab. Check out Chessable today and get 30 days of pro for free. Go to chessable.com slash begin. Do you wish playing a chess game with a friend was as easy as sending them a text? Well, good news. Now it is. With chess.com's new iMessage app, you can start and play a game directly in iMessage. Your friend doesn't even need a chess.com account. It's just tap and play. Head over to go.chess.com slash iMessage or use the command iMessage in chat to learn more.
Hello everyone and we are back in the heart of Chongqing. This is where the Women's World Championship is being played right now. This is where champions will be crowned. And we will find out exactly what Ju Wenjun chose to play in one of the most critical positions we have seen so far in Game 11. Look at that bustling metropolis and look at the board which is bustling with activity. Now did she or did she not play the committal F4, F5, F4 and Ji Wenjin said no. It was a question of risk. It was a question of gambling in an ordinary game. I'm sure she would have made that move. But this is no ordinary game. This is the Women's World Championship match game 11. And there are only two classical games remaining. This one and tomorrow. So Ji Wenjin, I can see she played Rook E6. Now F4 still very much in the air. So is it time for Lei Ting Jie to do something about it or will she play, will she carry on ignoring the threat? Great question. I mean, I, I was going to say rookie six is not necessarily no, it's not yet because F4 kind of remains um, on the menu and honestly for, for a while I think is it's not clear what white, white can do, um, but impressive a calculation there by Ju Wen Jun because honestly, it was like a, a tightrope for White. But uh, to calculate, if we if we uh, review that the, the basic idea, like if let's say we make a, a nothing move here for White, um, so it's hard to six, so Bishop B three, just say does nothing. Sh sure, Bishop B three, and now so we B see that the, this move F four. Um, maybe got stronger, Jovi, because I think you need the bishop on c2 with, for the pressure on uh, g6, maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> so it's yeah. actually it's getting harder to play a nothing move, which is is, is kind of a good sign for Juwen Jun, actually. Because now after f4, uh, we see that uh, um, g4 um, doesn't look as good as it was before because the bishop is a bit misplaced, right? So it takes on g4 here. Um, and when you take back, again, there's this idea of F3 check. Queen takes F3, um, and you're compelled to sacrifice the exchange. But there's a problem here that after knight F4 check, king moves. Um, yeah, this, this is the king moves. <laughs> I don't know where. Uh, I don't know either. Um, okay, we have a move from Lady J, but yeah, here I don't know, maybe King G3. Oh, no, no. <laughs> but I was going to say, the, the problem is now when we take on E2 and Queen takes E2, E4 blasts open the position, right? Whereas before your yeah. Bishop on C2 was protecting against that idea. So Bishop E3 actually, I think, makes these lines a lot more powerful for Black. Um, but let's take a look and see what happened in the game as um, every move matters so much right now. Um, it looks like the move king to f1 was played by Lei Ting Che. So what is the idea there to get away from the check? So now if f4, um, g4, takes on g4, takes on g4, note that there isn't that knight to f4 check idea. So I'm guessing that's the rationale here. But it, yeah. it looks weird. <laughs> it, it certainly does look weird to put your king on f1. And I uh, yeah, Totally, it's a reaction to f4 because after here there is no f3 anymore because you're just like, well, rook e4. Don't don't get tempted to capture this pawn because then rook f8 and suddenly the king might be feeling rather nervous on on uh, the f line. There's also bishop um, taking the pawn as well as rook f8 idea. So just walk around that pawn and play rook to e4 and suddenly these are the ideas that are going to come into play and it's going to be the black king that is feeling very shaky so king f1 is a good it's a weird move but i think it's a good one to stop f4 and just waiting moves after waiting moves maybe but it sure is tense and i can tell you one thing when you play this type of position and both sides are waiting it takes a lot of energy from you because you have to look at every single possibility you have to be sharp and this kind of chess leaves you exhausted and we see mm. Ju and Jun with 18 minutes 
on the court. I don't like this position. I don't like this position for Lightning Che. I think that June June has an excellent chance in this game now. I, I, I mean, I know that her defensive skills, Lightning Che, are very strong. So maybe she'll find a way out. But I hate this for her because it's not like F4 is my only idea, especially now mm. that you are your your work's on H1. It's it's like a bit artificial. If you play F4, I can play G4, and that's why I have my work on H1. But what if you don't play F4? What if you Just switch change. your plan to like trying to break open with E4 at some point? Now suddenly, the fact that my king's in F1 and the rook in H1, they, they look ridiculous, right? So I, I, you just gotta love Ju and June's position here. There's nothing bad about it. The question is, is it, that's for sure. There's nothing bad about her position, but the question is, is it good enough? And I'm mm -hmm. just starting to feel. I'm just starting to feel like it might be. I, I, I'm I'm getting really nervous about Lei Ting Tae's position here. Right, and one of the things that you can do is simply wait. Like you mentioned, I, I don't know how to wait. And, oh, okay, well, 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 uh, we have uh, Bic, our producer, with all the big shot ideas, and he's saying that black can even play bishop to g7 with the idea of bishop to h6 with the beautiful idea, which we've seen time and time again, and we've been obsessed by, f4. But yeah, what is this king doing on f1? What is the rook on h1? It looks and, a bit uh, strange. And Bix's idea is basically well, how does that how does that change things with the whole g4 idea? Because g4 basically all, our entire idea against f4 is to gain counterplay with g4, right? Mm -hmm. So is is there something like knight e3 check? Is that the point that the bishop on h6 allows us to play knight e3 check? Why why is this good? Yeah, I, I, that would be the most natural idea. So, so let's say, for instance, say you wait. Let's just keep waiting. And now let's play bishop h6 and let's keep waiting again. Right. <laughs> and get this position. So let's say we can see the big idea. So f4, g4. And yeah, mm -hmm. the whole idea is, as you guessed it, knight to e3 check. And now the f file is smashed open um, right with the king on f1 looking embarrassed as it does not want to be on that line as uh, um, black's pieces uh, are encroaching and yeah this looks this looks amazing um, uh, nice nice find uh, as somebody in the twitch chat, twitch chat said give that producer a raise <laughs> <laughs> well in this, in this case it's that bishop on h6 that's getting a raise right it's getting promoted into the heart of the position um, we can go to F4. It's defending the the real rock in Lei Ting Che's throat here um, with the pawn on E3. But that hasn't happened yet. So let's give yeah. her a chance to defend because we know that there's been a lot of promising positions um, for both players in the match, and and usually the defensive skills stop blood from being spilled. Right? It was just those two games where we had decisive results, but. You've called the entire match, Jovi. That those are certainly not the only promising positions, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, we've seen both players when put under pressure, they have risen to the challenge. I mean, let's say for instance, um, just now in game ten with Ju Wan Jun, you know, she played in an accurate move. She put her knight on f three. And when she needed to, she was more than capable of just undoing that move and retreating it to where it came from in order to defend against Lady J's potential attack. And we've also seen Lady J, she's been willing to sacrifice two pawns in order to maintain some dynamic balance. And she's held some very difficult endings. And King to G7 played by Ju Wan Jun. Really, uh. I've been impressed with both of them. And the accuracy has gone down by 1% though for Ju Wan Jun. Oh no, it's moved back up. The computer was just messing with me. It was 98%. Now it's back up to 99. Now here's a, here's a question for um, for you, for Lei Ting Che. What if she just is able to um, catapult her king to B1? So like a very what? long king walk. Let's go king E1, king B1, king C1, king B1. And, and maybe we're safer over there. And, and we can start thinking about, uh, you know, getting G4 in ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> it's a plan. It didn't occur to me, I, I'll be honest with you. But it, it is a plan. And you can see the fact that the computer hasn't really 
like the evaluation bar hasn't moved that much. It's not like 0.31, which means that, okay, it's a viable plan, but let, let's have a look. Like how far can you go with the king? So I don't, there's, again, there's no opening to the position because if you go F4, G4 is, com is coming. Um, so say you wait, let me just wait. Let, let, let's wait it out yeah. to king h7. And now, yes, go. Where do you want to go with the king? King to d1? Sure, king d1. Let's uh, put ourselves in the line of fire. And I, I think this is the problem that if we step to the d file, now um, e4 looks uh, very concerning, right? Because uh, we can not touch that d pawn with the uh, the discovery on tap, right? Knight, knight takes c3 check would be completely devastating. Um, well, you do have rook, I'm sorry, it's a double check. Ooh, it's a double check, double look check, at that. Yeah. And now and now we're in, uh, yeah, those are rare. Huh? Double checks, yeah. you don't see that every, every World Women's Championship day. <laughs> so uh, King King E one is okay, but you really can't cross that D bridge. So the king yeah. is always going to be uncomfortable unless queens come off the board. To be honest, I mean kings, um, the white king is never going to rest happily until queens are traded. Totally, and uh, with E four as well, I guess, I guess you could try to lock. Could you kind of try to lock the position down with this? Uh, no, because the pawn will come to C five, and. Once again, if one side is playing with a king exposed, that side in opposite color bishop middle games, you are going to lose. So definitely not, as Jennifer says, you can play your king to e1, but you can't step to the left. And uh, wait, did she play king e1? She did? She did. Uh, yeah, she, she did. did. She did. Yeah, she did play king to e1. And now it's uh, back on June and June. Who's, who, by the way, the clock times have now flipped as it's uh, Lei Ting Shei who has got a five minute time advantage. And this doesn't surprise me because, you know, it's all about Ju and Jun deciding what to do. White um, doesn't have, on a, oh, I guess it does surprise me a little bit, but it's also like she maybe had to calculate that line with G4, but in a way it was her only idea. Whereas Ju and Jun is the one making the decisions. Should I break with F4? Should I break with E4? Um, and uh, Lei Ting Che is forced to react and, you know, use her great defensive abilities. So I wouldn't be surprised to see this um, time differential exacerbate as um, Ju Wen Jun could really get down to her final minutes here in the time control as she thinks, can I break with either of these moves, E4, F4? Mm -hmm. And also, King E1 is such a weird move that for sure it would have taken this plan of going King F1, King E1 by surprise. And like you say, you know, she is the aggressor. She needs to be thinking about those opening moves. And by opening moves, I mean moves like E4, F4. And she needs to calculate them. She, and she has to do it relatively quickly. If she decides that, nope, this is not the order of the day, then she can simply wait. But it feels weird, right? You, your opponent plays king, messes around with the rooks, plays king g1, king f1, king e1. I mean, can you resist the urge <laughs> to actually yeah. stop yourself from breaking through? I mean, Oh, yeah, she's feeling it and she makes a move. What does she do? Rook to h8, okay. H <laughs> not what I expected at all. Let's see. Um, is she trying to play for G5? Is that, could that be what's behind this move? Yes, looks like it. And, hmm. and okay, ooh. So there was actually a stronger move than Rick H8. So our producer Big is uh, telling us that C5 was a great hmm. move. Well, wow, that's a, I didn't even cross my mind. So the idea is no. after the queen takes pawn, Rick C6. And okay. once the queen moves back, boom, you open up the position just like that and destabilize this knight. And after c5, so this one is actually just very dangerous for white because of this pawn, because you have to go pawn takes, uh, pawn takes. And when the position opens up, if your king is exposed, remember that it doesn't matter so much about material, it matters about king safety, then white will not live long in this position. But if you ignored it and you're like, no, no, I can't touch that pawn, in the words of MC Hammer, and just play king to d2, 
and try to run away. Then B5. Whoa. <laughs> our, our producer Bic is a magician. Is the move of the day. So after pawn takes, then uh, as our chat, they managed to get to en passant. Knight there takes we got B6. it. Yeah. And Rook takes B6. And again. That makes sense. Hmm. All right, c5 with the idea of playing b5. Okay, yeah, that makes that makes sense, but very unusual, right? Because it's not just that you're sacrificing a pawn, but even the the scheme of uh, playing c5 to play b5 when that wasn't the arena of action and, and until just now, uh, very unusual. Um, so instead, we didn't see that. We saw rook h8, Rick which is just a waiting move as a. Uh, she was starting to feel the time pressure. And now we got to move back from Lei Ting Che. She's played king to d1. So she has put her king in that line of fire. And now I'm sure that rook wishes it was back on e8. Right. And uh, that's what I also think Ju Wan Jun will play. And now the big question is, can you? It's a one-time only opportunity. Open up with e4. Or will she choose something else? She's put a rook on h8. Either she will play yeah. g5 or she will just wait and put the rook on e8. All right. Well, blast off with a. You're right. Remember earlier, like earlier, we, we said you can't go in the line of fire because e4 is so strong. It's so annoying that our rook is now um, out of place and this gives White that chance to improve her king position with king to d1. Can we take advantage of it as you you question? That is the big question. E4 right now. Let's see what happens. And whilst a Ju Wanjun is thinking, let's dive in and have a look at the consequences. She has nine minutes on the clock and it's move 35. So still plenty of time. Let's, shall we go? Yeah, do it. it. E4. It, you can see the tension in her body. She knows. I mean, great players sense the critical moment. I mean, I don't think you have to be as great of a player as Ju Wenju to notice that this is critical. But uh, yes, like just for those of you who are watching, think about the way that Jovi, Ju Wenju, me, we're like, it's now or never. You don't get a second opportunity for that king to be on exactly that square because it's not about being on D1, it's you're in route to C1 and B1. Um, so e4, let's see what happens. We take on e4 here as white with the f pawn. Yeah. Take we, back. And now, um, earlier, I think we were. We, we, we weren't going. We weren't going d4 because of c5. Because of c5. So I think that one is still very much too hot to handle. But before we couldn't run with a king because of I guess pawn takes pawn. But now there is no pawn takes pawn because. Would you have it? The Rock. rooks are now facing off against each other. So I'm guessing that you could run. That's what I would do. I always use the word skedaddle because you know you often don't you know you can't use that word in any conversation. But you can in chess when the king is just getting out of there. Skedaddle indeed. And now that pin it shows us why Rook Age Eight gave Leiting J the chance to escape with her king. The grand long long castling right they call it castling by hand <laughs> i mean I don't know, this is <laughs> castling by long hand that's for sure is uh it's taken her um a big king yeah. walk but it, it could pay off with some king safety here um uh, great point no uh takes on d3 because but we should look at that anyway right because just just to show pawn takes d3 um rook takes e6 rook takes rook. And now pawn takes c2. It looks like you're somehow encroaching on white's position, but in fact, there's nothing here. We don't, we could just take on c2, I think, right? I mean, that would seem to be the most. With the queen, with the king, I, I mean, both look look good, doesn't it? This pawn is not long for the world. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you take with the king and then rook hg1. And this knight on c4 is so well placed and this is no targets. Oh. Every one of these two pieces, they're just looking at a wall. Yeah, and always 
when you have a kind of position like this with this piece imbalance of rook versus the minor piece, always look at the rooks and whether they can move, whether they're standing on an open line, whether they have the potential. And if they can, then you do not have the necessary compensation. What an Same goes for if you're just, yeah. What an instructive very moment. Instructive. Yeah, very, very much that, uh, you see, it, sometimes it's easier to be the defender because Lei Ting had one thing on her mind. Can my king get safer? Mm -hmm. And so she was waiting for that opportunity. Whereas Zhu Wenjun, on the other hand, had so many things on her mind. Can I break with F4? Can I break with E4? Can I, you know, hold the tension and wait to the time control to decide? So many questions running through her head. Whereas the defender, it's more focused. You know what you need to do. Totally. Totally. And someone did say to me, it's easier to attack than defend. And Ju Wen Jun, she decides the moment is now and she pushes that pawn to E4. And uh, well, we are going to see a big opening of the position and questions for Lei Ting Che. A very quick answer of pawn takes pawn. I did wonder whether she might like try to round up the pawn with Rook H1 and what is Lei Ting J going to play now. Remember, her position is still very much in the balance. One wrong move here, and it could cost her the game. So pawn takes pawn. You don't want to be playing that because of this knight takes pawn double check, or the knight can come to e3 and give a double check. That is not in on the table. And king c king c1 is, a, for me, the most natural move. Get the king out of dodge. Well, one question here, Jovi, is uh, if uh, if we try to play the move like e3 to distract your knight, so that if knight takes e3, queen takes a5, then how does the analysis look there? I'm threatening oh. some queen a1 check action as well. Okay, so yeah, e3, and yeah, you, you said it. If the knight is decoyed to win this e3 pawn, then queen takes, let's just put it on the board, knight takes e3, queen takes pawn check, uh, queen takes pawn, it's not a check, but uh, queen a1 is definitely happening. Oh, hang on a second, can you do some? Hmm, oh, how nice. How is this, how is this like, hang on a second, knight takes e3, because somehow I felt like could do, there's some pinning going on here. I was like, I want to put, I want to put something. Right, right. Like or if we H E eight or something. Um, yeah, we got to be very careful here because White now is threatening the move Knight to F five check to take advantage of that discovered attack and win the rook on E six. So that's yeah. a that's a big threat we need to keep in mind. So even Queen A five, we might be able to do that. And oh, E three is on the board. E pawn. E three. E three played, and okay. So now the big question is: Knight takes pawn. Is that possible? With the idea that Queen takes a five is going to be met by Knight to f five, check. But the consequences of uh, and there you pick up the rook. But the consequences of uh, Knight takes e three is that you are voluntarily putting yourself in a pin. And so I'm just wondering, <laughs> also, who the diagonal over here. And if this pawn went on h4, I would be playing bishop g5 faster than you could. In fact, maybe you can still play bishop g5. Oh, wait a second. Okay, so bishop g5, pawn takes g5, queen g5, rook e1. Um, and, then, uh, and then rook e8, just piling up on the pin piece. Is that the idea? Yeah, that's what or, I thought, or is it rook f8? King d2. Ah, that's rook f8. Yeah. It's got to be rook f8, and oh boy, now the queen is ousted. It could go to g1 though, right? But then rook f3. You go to g1. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. I, I put the, yeah, rook f3. Oh, that's a nice move. Oh, rook, rook f3. f3. And then king d2. And if you come and just hold, you, you, you now go like this. Oh boy, this is beautiful. Beautiful chess. This idea is stunning. Oh gosh. Totally. Now you can go back to f2 though, so you're still hanging on. But now we have two pawns for the piece. Um, oh, a rook g. Is there a rook? Knight takes. There's a rook g two. Rook g two. Yeah. It. Wow. Oh boy. Rook g two. 
and you, you, you can't take on a6 because rook takes f2 comes with a check. Oh no. Wait a second. What's going on here? What if, what if queen takes g2, queen takes g2, rook on 1 to e2? Are we? Yeah, you oh, can still queen g5, queen, queen g5, g5 again. Oh. So uh. that, okay, that's, that's a kind of really complicated line. And, okay. But e3 in, in general, I don't think I would be taking that knight just because, oh, she's taken it. She's taken it. But this bishop g5 move is, is a tactic. Uh, you know, this is a tactic from outer space. This is such a beautiful line. Gorgeous, gorgeous idea. Will she see it? Yeah. She's five minutes on the clock, and I think she's going to play rook hg8. That's way more natural. And she plays that very quickly. So... Yeah. Rook, rook H8. Oh, and we got a big cross. So that means that there was a better opportunity, probably that bishop g5 move. That bishop g5, but that's extremely unusual uh, tactic, Jovi, just to put your bishop on that. And to put your bishop on a square where they can just take it, and then uh, it's actually a pure sacrifice because you don't really gain your piece back right away. Um, I, I think in a game where she's not down to five minutes, sure, maybe that idea would occur to you, but... With just five minutes on the clock, um, it's it's a really outer space idea. It's very unusual. Totally, totally. And also, we're kind of guided by the evaluation bar, telling us that what's the right move, what's the wrong move as well. So we get help. So <laughs> I don't think. And also, I, uh, <laughs> it was two of us working through things. So no, no, no. I don't think. Ricochet, very natural, piling up on <laughs> the e3 knight and i'm expecting the pile up to continue is is oh but hang on if there's rook g8 you could still do the same idea well it's a little tricky because remember we were using that tempo to play um rook f8 right so uh mm. well, yeah, what are yeah. you what are you playing um for white now rook g1 yeah and now rook g1 and now bishop g5 wouldn't work because you just take it and uh, you have King D2, and uh, you're, you're a whole tempo down from the lines that we looked at before, right? And uh, there we see Ju and Jun trading the knights on the board. And now a set of rooks have left. All the rooks have been traded off and they have passed move 40 and now queen takes pawn has been played all right so and he, it's, so we, it's a bit unusual but the players are not allowed to offer a draw until move 40. the players haven't been offering draws by the way at any point oh no there but only now can they offer a draw and uh, we have now a situation where it's queens on the board queen ending but opposite color bishops and again, general rules of king safety very much apply. If the queens come off and it's an opposite color bishop endgame, should be a draw. Yeah, yeah. It, it does look like there's a high chance of a draw now of two great defensive players and, and a very balanced position. But you know what? That moment. Now, I know it's a computer line and some people will say, ah, computer line, whatever. Nobody's going to see that. But I got to say, it was a beautiful line. Yeah, a very beautiful we go line back? and very instructive. Uh, should we go back and show it? So, okay, so knight takes e3. Uh, so no, hang on, wrong one, wrong one, wrong one. So yeah, knight takes e3. Instead of, you have to go back before rook yeah, e8. I mm -hmm. have to go, I have to go here. So knight takes e3 and the most amazing move could have been bishop g5. Just imagine that, that would have shocked completely shocked Ju and Jun. And so we were looking at the most forcing lines, which was simply if you take the bishop and after queen takes pawn, we were like, okay, what will happen if white just holds on to that extra piece? And this is where you had this most amazing rook f8. Queen again, resolutely holds onto this, the material. And now the rook can come down here, piling on the pressure. And then the big point is that after you've removed this, the queen comes to f2. So, we, you know, white is really stubborn. In, in this line, I think white should perhaps say, okay, you won back the piece. I'm going to give you that one. 
but uh, knight takes knight and after rook takes rook to g2 and now yeah very we have won the day very nice and, it, and it, yeah it's just it's just a, it's just quite a marvelous line with a lot of tactics embedded in there so i, I encourage you to take a slow look at that um if you um if you feel like you need to work on your pins this game has been, had a lot of pins and a lot of discoveries and a lot of basic tactics in general you see the this is why i love looking at the uh the games of the greats because even if you don't play like a world champion yet there's always something you can learn from their moves that will apply to your own games. And here we, in this game, saw almost every basic tactic embedded in these variations. You know, we saw knight f4 check, a knight fork. We saw a clearance move, f3, clearing the, the f4 square for the knight. And then, of course, we saw discoveries and pins galore. Uh, and after all that said and done, we're left with this extremely balanced position because both sides have the same number of pawns. And the only question is, is there gonna be any difficulty for black to defend that pawn on G6, right? So she needs to make sure that queen D3 doesn't come with any kind of devastating threat. Mm -hmm. Totally. And uh, we do see Ji Wen Jun employ a very important idea in, in uh, queen endings. You're going to centralize the queen. And just to piggyback on your point, you know, about this game, we've seen a lot of uh, positions where there's been a lot of danger lurking beneath the surface. I mean, we've seen, you know, both sides brewing up for a potential attack, both sides having to constantly anticipate what the opponent is going to play. And of course, they've had to assess the risk as well. Let's uh, not forget that because this is game 11 of the World Championship match. It's a 12 game match and the stakes are getting higher and higher. And let's not forget that these players have been playing since July, the beginning of July. I can't even remember. It feels like a lifetime ago. And tiredness is going to start creeping in at one point. And uh, Queen D5 is a nice move with the idea of queen to f7 and also potential queen to h1 checks. Yeah, queen h1 check is uh, certainly a, a great idea that, you know, could be a way to kind of transition this game into uh, even more drawish waters. Uh, but, mm -hmm. I mean, this was not a drawish game at all. Wow. I mean, Ju Wenjun really had some exciting opportunities and she was pressuring Lei Ting Shi and if this game is a draw, Ju and Jun will get a crack with white. And she did win a game earlier in this match with the white pieces, so she'll have that chance uh, before, of course, um, we would have a playoff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if... Yeah, playoff will be happening if it is happening on the Sunday, and then we'll have a glorious weekend of chess. Yeah. But uh, for now, this one looks like it's heading into karma waters, and will fizzle out to a draw if the queens get traded then for white it will be all about simply just moving these pawns onto light squares maybe transferring the bishop to d1 and pushing g4 mm. for black on the other hand it will just be about uh, holding this g6 point and uh, making sure there's a, not a rogue bishop that <laughs> finds itself on c8 if that happens well then black might have some problems but still even this opposite color bishop ending is still quite tricky i would say it, it can be tricky but if you think about um lady che's worries just a few moves ago like, oh, god this must be a relief to have this position i mean you're staring down the barrel of f4 e4 your king's in the middle of the board your brook's disconnected and then like a half hour later you have this Ah. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 this is the moment where you must not let down your guard because so many times this has happened and it's always like move 41 is the <laughs> you've you've gone through this terrible time control you you've survived the time pressure and then you can kind of you breathe a sigh of release relief and then 
you make a blunder and then you just look at it and you're like, why did I do this? <laughs> why did I make such a move? So both these players cannot relax until the game is over. The score sheets have been signed. And also this is really good advice for when you're playing a top player and you are winning. Do not count your chickens before they hatch. I say this time and time again because grandmasters they are so tricky they're, they're such slippery creatures and until you have won the game <laughs> that's it be aware they will try to trick you at every opportunity yeah that's a that's a great point and, and it is true it's funny how i mean i'd love to see a statistical analysis of blunders and what moves they're most common on i uh, i'm sure it would be earlier in the game just because it's like well, sometimes games don't get to move 40 or 41, but like percentage wise, it's got to really cluster around like move 39. And then, of course, right after as well, as you point out. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> Lei Tingche <laughs> with her gestures again, just feels like she's saying, oh, I'm expecting this to be a draw, but you are right. She will be very happy to have reached this position. And what can we expect from Lei Ting J? I saw a suggestion from chat saying King B1. I, I really like that move. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then just King B. Well, then uh, the Queen H1 check uh, could lead to a perp because you, you know, well, if Queen C1, it's a bishops of opposite color endgame with, right. with no clear advantage. That should be an easy draw. And if King A2, Queen back to D5 check. Um, and then I guess you could play Bishop B3. Uh, but then there's Queen A5 check. Uh, and wow, this just looks like there's a lot of there's a lot of checks going around. Queen F5 check. And we're kind of like uh, triangulating all of our checks. Oh, the, those expressions. Yeah. Those expressions are amazing. You know, it kind of reminds me, like, she's expressive throughout the whole game, but it's also, like, in poker, you know, you're not supposed to be super expressive. But then, once the cards are turned over and everybody's all in, you can make whatever expression you want, right? And I do feel there's a little bit of that going on, because, let's face it, this game is going to be a draw, right? I mean, it's, it's not 100%, but let's say it's close to that, right? So she can make whatever expression she wants at this point. Um, it, You know, it's... It's, it's fair game. You don't need to have a poker chess face anymore. You can just uh, <laughs> be you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And whilst we wait for Leiting J to make a move, let's have a look at how she found her way into the Women's World Championship. Challenger Lei Ting Jie is trying to become the 18th Women's World Champion in history and the 7th from China. She would join a prestigious list that includes Xi Jun, Ho Yufan and her opponent in this match, Ju Wen Jun. Lei Ting Jie has already made history several times. She is just one of seven women to become a Grandmaster as a teenager. In 2021, Lei won the first ever Women's Grand Swiss and she did it by a whopping one and a half points, starting the event an amazing eight out of nine. With a round to spare, no one could mathematically catch her. That dominant victory put Lei into the candidates tournament, one step shy of the world championship. Three short match victories and she would be the challenger. Lei won them all and she never even needed a tie break. For her first battle held in Monaco, Lei faced off against former world champion Maria Muzichuk. Lei won immediately in the first game, then secured three draws to advance to the semi-final. Lei wasn't done with the Muzichuk family yet. Next came Anna Muzichuk, Maria's older sister. The players started with three draws, partially flipping the script from the previous round. But the match ultimately produced the same result. Lei won the fourth game and with it, her second match. The final move to China where Lei faced her compatriot Tan Zhongyi. Like Maria Muzichuk, Tan Zhongyi is a former world champion. Tan greeted Lei coldly in the very first game, delivering Lei's first loss of the candidates. How would Lei deal with her first adversity of the qualification cycle? By taking over the match and never losing again. 
She won game two and game four and game five. Her third win clinched the match with a game still on the schedule. Just like in the last round of the Grand Swiss, it wasn't needed. Now Ju and Jun awaits. Has the three-time champ finally met her match in Lei Tingjie? And that is indeed the way that Lei Tingjie found herself seated in this chair by winning the Grand Swiss by winning the candidates and defeating Tang Zhongyi in the final. And what are we seeing on the board? It looks like we are seeing a repetition, Jovi, as the players are banging out the moves now. I mean, let's, let's check how many times have we gotten this Queen H1 check, King D2, Queen G2, King D1. Um, so I think we've gotten two reps so far. Mm -hmm. um, both players are getting late in J moving the king to e2 queen check well there it is king to d1 and uh, we do have this I think this will be the third time it is the players are looking at each other and a draw has been agreed and what an exciting game 11 what a game so many possibilities so much tension so much pressure brewing i mean these two players they keep entertaining us on every single level jen <laughs> what I mean, are your impressions of the game i think a lighting chair is definitely breathing a big sigh of relief as she um escaped a really troublesome position where you know she she could have she could have lost the game she was under the time her position was under pressure but now this sets us up for an absolutely fantastic women's world chess championship final weekend we're gonna have game 12 where june and june's gonna get the white pieces and if that game's a trial too we get what everybody wants. We get those playoffs where we're gonna get to see rapid chess, blitz chess, but you know what? After this weekend, somebody is going home with the crown. Yes, somebody is going home with the crown. And uh, let's remind ourselves of the scoreboards because there's been a lot of draws, but both players have won one game each. Leiting J winning in game five and Ju Wenjun striking back in game eight. And today it could have gone either way. We did see Ju Wenjun pressing as Jan did mention. And of course, let's look, have a look at the schedule. We have just one more classical game remaining. And there, Ju Wenjun begins with the white pieces. What do you expect from Ju Wenjun, Jan? I expect, you know what? I expect a, a little bit of pressing, but I, I'm going to predict the playoffs because that's what I want. So I'm going to predict it. <laughs> I'm going to predict what I want, Jovi. How about you? <laughs> Uh, I I think you're on the right track, but I do expect that uh, Ju Wenjun will be pressing hard. She will want to finish the match tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, talking about tomorrow, we are in store for some amazing action as it is the last classical game in the Women's World Championship match. Nothing, and I mean nothing, it can yeah. separate the, the two. Both players yeah. on five and a half yeah. points. Well, until tomorrow, we will find out exactly what happens. Jen, it's been a pleasure, and I look forward to commentating on all the action at the same time, same place tomorrow. And thank you to everyone at home who's joined in on the fun and sent us Twitch messages and it's been a lot of excitement and in the meantime I'm gonna thank you all for watching and see you tomorrow same time see you. same bye. place bye bye, bye. From, bye from Fabi and me uh, <laughs> bye Fabi